this is SJS Reports. I'm Lloyd the Cuesta. New York has its Broadway, Hollywood has its Sunset Strip, and in San Jose, it's First Street. snacks and um we have bonus gifts for anyone who sees three or more films today you can choose between a go bag or a uh scarf <laughs> library brandon um, i'm carly low i'm a university archivist um i'm really excited about sharing these films with all of you today uh in this first segment you're going to hear a little bit about how these films came to be created and how um we came to even have them in the archives so that we could share them with you. Uh, we have a lot to see, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started right now. Let's uh, make this cut now. Well, first thing you do, of course, is you go in and you cut the tape with a pair of scissors. Well, now, all of you know that I can't see the tape. You know for certain sure that I couldn't possibly tell whether I was cutting at the end of a picture or anything else. I'm going to place the tape over here. Get back to it in just a moment. I'm just making a rough cut at about the point where I want things to occur. I'll go down. I'll do exactly the same thing at the other end. I've got the point on the tape marked. I'll go in with a pair of scissors and I'll make a very rough cut. And then we have the piece of tape that we no longer want. We're through with that, we can throw it away. We take this end off. Now we're ready to make a much more accurate cut. And what we're going to do is use the solution that you saw earlier with the fine iron filings suspended in it. Mix the solution up good to get everything into suspension and use a cotton swab. Now we won't go to the trouble of developing out all of the tape, because all we really have to see is one corner of the tape. Now, on camera, you probably will not be able to see this any too well. It's kind of difficult to see, even uh, with the naked eye. Under the microscope, we can see it quite easily. We'll do exactly the same procedure on the other piece of tape. Apply the iron filings along the control track edge. What we want to see are those small, bright pulses that we talked about on the, on the control track, because those will tell us where we must make the cut. Now I can take the piece of videotape and place it in this side of the editor and lower the lid down. And now I have control by this knob so that I can position the tape back and forth. So that when I'm looking into the microscope, I can tell exactly where I'm positioning. So what I do is roughly position it for an edit pulse that I can see by eye. Then place the hair lines right between two tracks of video information. I smack between them in accordance with the with the edit pulse. And then I use a small lock on the side of the machine to lock the tape down so it won't move. Okay, and we make the cut. Okay, we've got our two pieces of tape cut. We've got one small mechanical problem now, however, and that is that this side of the tape is the oxide side. It's the side the picture's recorded on. If I were to just take a piece of splicing tape and run it down along this side, I'd be obscuring part of the picture and the machine would go crazy when it came to that. I've got to get the tape on the other side. Now, how do I do that? I use this little lever, for one thing, which raises the ends. And then on this platen here, we're able to pull out the splicing tape that we're going to use, sticky side up. And we release the lever and slide it in underneath the tape. Now we use the same lever we used to raise it, and we lower the tape down on top of the splicing tape. And we're very careful now to 
tap down the edges, like so. Be very careful to avoid any overlaps. That's trim. As I say, there are several disadvantages. You may notice me uh, blowing little pieces of crap off the tape here. One of the problems is that whenever you handle the videotape, you can get dirt onto it. The iron filings that we use to develop things out are a form of dirt. Whenever you get dirt on the tape, you run the danger of uh, having dropouts in the reproduced picture. Those are those black flashes that you see on the screen. Well, let's see if we had any success. Let's take a look at this picture. Okay, we'll wait for the splice to come along, and uh, ought to be along any moment now, and watch the picture. Well, not the best splice in the world, but a pretty good one. Oh, hi. What we hope to do in this tape is show you how to use electronic editing to put a bunch of shots together using U-Matic cassettes, a couple of Sony machines, and the TRI editing controller! What we assume is that you already know a little bit about electronic editing, you know, you know what its nature is all about. Uh, you know the terms that we use, you know, like in edits and out edits and control track and master scene and all that kind of stuff. And that you pretty much know how to set up a videotape recorder. You know what the adjustments are that are common to most tape machines, you know, like tracking and skew and those kinds of adjustments. Uh, if you don't know those things already, then I don't really think you should be watching this tape because uh, it's not really going to make a whole lot of sense. If you do know them, um, then the place we're going to start is uh, at the, you know, right at the very beginning of an editing session where you start to set up the videotape machines and do control track run and all that kind of stuff. We're going to go through all the way through that. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the process of doing an audio video edit, uh, a video only edit, and then an audio only edit. And then we assume after you, we've done those three and explained them to you, then you really probably can figure out almost everything you have to know to make the systems work. You at least be able to do 90% of the kinds of things that people do with, with electronic editing machines. First of all, a lot of people seem to think that videotape editing is a process a lot like film splicing, you know, where you cut and glue your best shots together. Basically, however, that's not really quite the way we do it. In a sense, videotape editing is more like making Xerox copies of something you typed. Instead of cutting your original tape, what you have to do is make a copy of your tape. One shot at a time, eliminating those parts of what you originally shot that you really didn't want and keeping those parts that you do. Allowing you to create on a second reel of tape a smooth continuous sequence of pictures and sounds. Now, I don't really think you should get too carried away with this example. In reality, tape editing is both like Xeroxing paper and like cutting film. Since editing is a system of copying, the pictures and sounds in your final edited tape aren't really going to be quite as good as they were when you recorded them. And therefore, you should realize that the degree to which they lose quality depends in part on decisions that you make and things that you do. For example, the condition of the machines that you use affects your completed program. The way you adjust those machines affects your program. The condition of the reels of tape that you use, new or old, makes a difference. Where you store your tapes, whether you smoke near your tapes, and several other seemingly insignificant things can affect the success of your project. So if you want to keep your audience from getting up and leaving, right, it's very important that you understand how to operate these machines. Question. When you edit a television project, are you confused about the difference between assemble mode editing and insert mode editing? Well, in order to clear some of that up, we're going to talk a little bit about how these two modes work. And more importantly, we're going to talk about when to use assemble mode and when to use the insert mode. Before we go any further, probably we should talk a little bit about how these two modes work. 
You probably already know that assemble mode is a function in editing that's used to transfer video and audio onto your master tape. And as it does that, it also records a series of control track pulses, which work kind of like the sprocket holes in film do to make your tape play back at the right speed when you watch your program. The other mode, the insert mode, is a function in editing that allows you to replace portions of the video or the audio in your master tape, but does not record the control track pulses and will not work properly unless there's a continuous series of control track pulses already present on your tape from an earlier recording. Okay, so much for the how of assemble mode and insert mode editing. Let's move on to the when. The fastest and easiest level of editing, and probably the one that everybody does first, is what we'll call all assemble mode editing. Essentially, that means editing that's done throughout your project in the assemble mode. Editing that tacks each shot onto the end of a previous shot to make a program sequence. For example, this very program, the one that we're doing right now, is being assemble mode edited together. So that each of these shots are strung together to make a sequence. What you're watching is all assemble editing. A great deal of editing can be done in this manner to accomplish most of the goals of a project, and certainly most news editing is done like this because of the pressures of time. But occasionally, programs need a little bit more. For example, if two adjacent shots get assembled onto your tape, forming what all the textbooks call a jump cut, some other video, some kind of a cutaway, has to be inserted on top of the jump to visually fix the problem. Now, we're gonna play back this jump that we just did and watch it this time. This time, we're gonna insert a cutaway of the book here to fix the problem. If two adjacent shots get assembled onto your tape, forming what all the textbooks call a jump cut, some other video, some kind of a cutaway, has to be inserted on top of the jump to visually fix the problem. Using the insert mode to cover video that has already been assemble mode edited together constitutes the second level of editing, what we'll call occasional insert mode editing. That's editing that you don't use very often, just occasionally, to cover portions of your program and editing that you do in the insert mode. Usually, this is the type of editing that gives people the most problem because it requires that you change back and forth from one editing mode to another which is where the problem arises because people will, at some point, forget to reset to the right mode for an edit. And usually that means that people try and insert something into the middle of a program while the machine is still in the assemble mode. And that's a big killer. Watch carefully. We're going to show you what happens to the television picture when you try to come out of an assemble edit. And to do that, to keep our own program honest, we're going to do it on a monitor so we don't get, get a problem on our own tape. Watch. Certainly, you don't want this mess in the middle of your program. Effectively, what happens is the assemble mode, when it stops, leaves a huge hole which destroys your project from that point on. And the net effect is you either spend days redoing all of your work or you consider a career in some other business. That brings us to the end of these clips. Um, if I can invite Kate Sanders to come on up and have a seat here. And I'm hoping that we have Bob Reynolds himself online. Let's see. <laughs> and I'll come sit with you in a moment, Keith. Do you want to come to the panelist table? Where would I find my uh, virtual panelists? <laughs> Under participants. I just see. Oh, the, attendee. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you for being Bob here. Reynolds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I just barely getting through it. All. Let me see if I can. And amid the legends. Right. So uh, here with us, we have Keith Sanders, who is the current uh, multimedia producer at SJSU and Bob Reynolds, who we just saw in these films, who was the former media producer here. Um, and it's really Bob who created most of, the, or you know, directed and or produced most of the films that we're gonna see in this film festival. And then Keith's work to uh, get them digitized that 
brought us to even being able to have this event. So I wanted to start by asking Bob, can you talk a little bit about uh, the significance of having a an on-campus television studio and what it allowed us to do here as far as teaching and learning on campus? Okay. Um, basically, our department was the first one in the state system. We were initially set up in 1957 to explore the potential of the use of television in communication on the campus. And that grew out of a project by uh, uh, Terry Martin, Gaither Lee Martin, a Texas former hospital administrator who was working on a uh, um, master's degree in psychology here. And uh, in that program, she had a television camera um, in a room with patients out at the old um, mental hospital out near uh, Cisco, which is out there now. And um, that was so successful that what they were doing was getting patients to say to somebody things that the patient wouldn't say to their doctor. This is a long story. I'm going to have to stay too much on it. But anyway, we were the first television facility in what was called the state college system at that time. I came on board in 1963 and started as a cameraman, and I've worked my way all the way up to uh, the, the sole producer. Um, watching all this on this archive, as they brought it to me and asked me to fill in all the relevant data, the descriptions and titles and everything, um, was really great for me because it allowed me, uh, surprisingly, to, to watch my whole career. Um, both uh, in terms of how the technology got better and how I got better in doing what I was doing. So the importance, I think, of the question you asked, the importance of a television facility on a campus is it allows kinds of communication that you just can't get in other, other ways. Um, for example, we were ultimately able to go out and shoot documentaries about people um, and see them in their work locations and how they um, uh, integrate or how they communicate with their own people. Uh, things that you just can't see if you um, bring that person on campus as a guest lecturer. Uh, so the reality of what they do, I think, is a little bit better on television than it is um, by by just bringing a, a guest on campus. Um, all right, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, Keith, can you tell us about how these all came to be digitized? Well, um, as far as digitizing the videos, it all kind of started because they were going to get rid of all the videos. You know, um, way back, I think it was probably 2016 or so, we got the uh, the clear mandate that we're going to basically have to open up our basement, and that means getting rid of all of our video and film. And so anyway, uh, I was just kind of in the right place at the right time. My supervisor said, well, okay, you need to do that. And so as I was going through, I saw... They were, these weren't always just uh, calculus videos and Math 101 and philosophy. There's a lot of tapes that uh, Bob Reynolds created. I didn't know at the time, but he created most of them uh, that were maybe, I would say, more historic in nature. So I kind of put those to the side. And uh, anyway, we got rid of tons and tons, literally, of videos. Um, but I didn't do it myself. Uh, I took... Um, three semesters, uh, 12 students. It took um, the funding from two managers because uh, there was some funding to actually uh, take these quad tapes. We didn't have a quad machine anymore mm. and actually get them digitized. Uh, so Rick Harden, he provided funding for me to do this. Uh, and Mike Wardley, he also provided the students for, for me to do this. So there was actually a team and we had two things going. One was uh, digitizing the quad tapes, which is really the 
their mother load. That was the best stuff. And then we also had a lot of cassette tapes of many different varieties that could be just copied on and digitized. And the students could do that because we did have those cassette um, tape machines after we refurbished them, which also took some money. So altogether, um, there were uh, probably five, six or seven thousand dollars spent at least in money for salaries and actually transfers to get this done. So it wouldn't have happened if those two managers hadn't stepped up. This would not have happened. OK, so that's great. Anyway, uh, after two years, uh, we ended up with uh, a whole bunch of uh, files. There were digital files. And we found right now there's about 600 really good videotapes that we got out of those files. Uh, for future generations, for other people, there's also a number of tapes that might have low audio or might not be synced correctly, where the audio video is not exactly correct. They could be fixed. And you could recover even more tapes from that. Yeah. So I have no doubt that down the road, we'll have over a thousand videos um, altogether, which is just, uh, which is great. So it basically took place really in 2017, um, finished in 2019. And the digitization really happened uh, just before COVID, you know, and we have all the files, but it takes a long time to take those files and to organize them. And so Bob, although certainly he helped originate all the tapes, which is the main thing, because I couldn't do what I did unless he did what he did, right? But also he really helped with the um, database to actually get a good spreadsheet put together. I helped as well. We both worked on it. But he could really add a lot of context to the descriptions, yeah. which was so great. And I know the library, you know, certainly wants that. Yeah. You know, it's important. <laughs> I mean, these are historic. You know, uh, so anyway, that's that's what happened. I I just came in after the fact, <laughs> not 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 the first forty years that the Bob that Bob did here. Thank you, Keith. Um, it's as far as on our end having all of that information, uh, that not just the digitized films, but also the metadata that Bob helped with, is really what made it possible for us to move forward with it and and create an archival collection, which is going live around 4 p.m. today at uh, digitalcollections.sjsu.edu. Um, any questions for Bob or Keith? Um, Bob. I know that a file cabinet out of the TV studio came into my possession and we've sent it over yes. of all the flat files, uh, the artwork and stuff. Yes. Have you been able to utilize that? We have, so we do have an ITV collection. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, ITV is the instructional television. Um, so we have an ITV collection that uh, is where, I think these are the files that you transferred to me. Is that right? They came through, okay, yeah, yes. And so those have been added to, to the existing ITV collection, yeah. We did, uh, uh, as far as I was concerned, I, I remember um, Bob had a big file cabinet that got moved over from Dwight Bennell Hall when they did the remodel. That's the one. That's the one. That's the one. So I, I took um, all of the historic pieces, and there were a lot. Yes. Um, you know, anything, anything other than newer scripts and things like that that I knew were not so much. But any of the artwork, slides, things like that. That the library has all that. Yes. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, you know, it's going to take a long time to organize everything, but it's all there. It's all been saved. I think it's actually been processed. I th yeah, that those materials that we worked to get that you tr transferred to us, that's already been processed. So it's 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 incorporated in the existing. OK, organize all of that ready. Wow, that's fantastic. Research. Yeah, our, okay. our student assistants. We have yeah, the, the other piece of it, too, that's kind of separate from the TV studio mm -hmm. where the slide files. Yes. Sam Koplowitz had as the AV producer. Right. So those have all come over here as well. I think we have those two. Yeah. Has anybody heard of uh, if I might? Yes. Buckminster Buckminster Fuller. Okay. Anybody under fifty? <laughs> okay. I have, oh, but I don't know if I count because. <laughs> uh, well, he uh, he uh, created the uh, geodesic dome. The idea of the geodesic dome made out of these triangles. Um, he was lecturing here. He lectured at our university for one semester in the spring of 1968, I believe. 
And we were lucky to record. Uh, Bob go, got all his lectures recorded. And those we saved because, uh, you know, not all, not most lectures were not saved, but these were one of a kind, one off lectures. You know, he just did it one time. And with those lectures came some slides. So down the road, what we might be able to do is take some of the slides that I think are still there, probably in that file cabinet mm -hmm. and match them with on a few lectures. He referred to some slides. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be great to actually, you know, integrate the two yeah. and you could see the full lecture as as everybody else saw. But anyway, that's just an aside. There's so much that went on. San Jose State is so rich in history. There's so much that went on. And because of Bob Reynolds and other people, I'm sure. But because of Bob Reynolds, a lot of this stuff was saved. And if it's not saved, it can't ever be digitize it can't ever nobody can ever see it later right. so we're really lucky really fortunate that our university besides being the first you know um, CSU was also really has a really well documented video history going back to the early 60s I don't know that's got to be pretty rare and it's pretty interesting and I'm so glad Carly that you have organize this event. I'm sure the first of many events like this, and you were taking care of being an archivist, taking care of all this. All the videos are in good hands with you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we've got to get on to the next segment. I know none of these are long enough, but I want to uh, give a round of applause to thank Keith and Bob. It's very important. I'm sure Bob and Keith will reinforce this. Gwen Pensinger. Oh, yeah. and yeah. who had in, we had actually invited and wasn't able to make it, but yes, Glenn Pensinger was the first person you saw in that. That's a good film. point. Yeah. 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 Right. Glenn goes back way before me. <laughs> we all we all stand on the shoulders of the giants before us, right? Yeah. I have to say he was the guy that hired me when I needed a job because I had a family and one kid to support and I wasn't making it in the shoe business. He got me a half-time job and then another half-time job in AV training projectionist. Um, wow. So I owe it all to Glenn. He was the one who had the wisdom. He'd work with me. I was a cameraman on shows he was directing, uh, most of the time live on Channel 11. Uh, so he knew I, who I was. And I walked in the door and said, I really need a job. He says, well, I can't start you today, but I can't start you tomorrow. And that was the beginning of, the beginning of my relationship with that. And just for the audience here, here's a quad tape. Oh, yeah. This is about 90 minutes of tape. It weighs about 25 pounds. <laughs> really, really heavy and really big. And this was the kind of tapes that were loaded onto the machines. We used to have more than one quad machine. And so we kept, we kept something like uh, over 400 full quad tapes. That's what I found when I walked in to the basement of Dwight Bennell Hall way back in like 2015. Now there's a lot of other tapes besides that, but these were the crown jewels. So I just, this is a, this is actually a brand new one that was never opened, but it's 60 years old. So anyway. Thanks for bringing those. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Right. That to this hard drive with all of the films we're seeing yeah. today. That's right. <laughs> the palm of my hand. All right, so our next segment um, is about the history of journalism here on campus. Thank you. basically live in the information age, which requires that we have people that are skilled at the language and at transmitting ideas. It doesn't make any difference whether it's actually doing news or whether they're transmitting things uh, for companies or for governments. They're going to need 
people with journalistic skills that can do that. The Spartan Daily was born in the spring semester of 1934. Several students wanted to make a daily newspaper out of the State College Times, which was a weekly. But those few enthusiastic students didn't realize all the work needed to produce a paper on a daily basis. They didn't have the facilities nor the organization. They needed help desperately. So three of them took a strong case to university president Thomas McQuarrie, and Dr. Dwight Bennell was hired to help the students with the paper. Bennell created a three-unit course to ensure regular attendance. You can't put out a daily with casual uh, attendance when your reporters feel like coming in, and so any morning you can run a football team that way or anything else. Since its birth, the Daily has never missed a scheduled edition, and it's been through some pretty rough times. During World War II, there were paper shortages, and the times when newsprint was hard to come by, even for commercial newspapers. But that didn't stop the Daily. There was a printer strike somewhere along there, I forget what year, when we ran the paper on the mimeograph machine for Oh, I think seven or eight issues, rather than not have any paper at all. In addition to the hard times, there were also some memorable moments. When World War II began with the attack on Pearl Harbor, our football team happened to be in Honolulu waiting to play a game. Our Spartan Daily editor, who happened also to be the football team manager, because men were kind of scarce at that time, uh, Dr. Bennell had arranged for him to go with the football team to Hawaii to cover everything. Nothing came from him, no words. We heard not a thing. And finally, I think it was 19 or 20 days later, the team came back to California. And in walks our editor casually, and Doc Bennell said to him, Well, where were your stories? He said, What stories? The game was never played. Today, the Daily still has its share of rough times and amusing moments. Over the years, the Daily has undergone many changes. The Spartan Daily has, has gotten bigger, uh, broader in, in scope, uh, uh, much more advertising. Of course, it takes a lot more advertising to pay for a paper this size. Now, when I started with that paper, we printed for $37.50 a day. Now, can you conceive of getting out a handbill for $37.50? But more than just the cost of printing has changed. The newspaper has gone from using typewriters to using video display terminals. One thing that will never change, though, is the amount of work required to put out the paper. Students who read the Spartan Daily take the paper for granted. Most don't fully understand all of the work involved to produce a single edition of the Daily. We don't throw the paper up into the air and it all somehow gathers itself together. It takes about a um, staff of around um, 10 editors um, to make sure that it's all right. All the stories in the Daily are written by students on the Daily newspaper writing staff, except for the few stories that are taken off the AP wire. Not just anyone can be on the Daily staff. Prerequisites must be met first. An editing class and two basic writing courses are required. But once a staff member, the Daily is an invaluable learning experience. There's, it's a great experience. Uh, it's a daily thing where you go out and report, uh, and it's just like being out in a regular newspaper. It's no different. You have a day, daily deadline. On most newspapers, you're lucky to get one or two stories in a week. In a daily, you can get as much as 10 a week. And the idea is that they give you experience here, and that's the main thing. I think that it's a good experience because I think people really learn um, enough about the journalists experience to be able to then make a decision as to why, whether they want to continue. Daily reporters are responsible for filling 60% of the paper with news stories. The uh, first weekend you come in, you do stories, general assignment, the uh, city editor gives you stories. Uh, after the second week, you're assigned a beat, and then it's up to you. Uh, you work your beat, uh, you go to the meetings, you go to the people that uh, are the major uh, people in your beat, and you come Yeah, hi. And it's, uh, it's basically sink or swim. Oh, could After you see me? reporter finds the source and gets the information yeah. firsthand, the reporter writes and rewrites the story in the VDT until it's um, just right. Later, it's proofread yeah, by well, the editors. Yeah, we go Does through each of the okay? stories, usually about three times. Um, try to check basic things like spelling and grammar. And I don't like know that. if it's and we're still reported. trying to, oh, to well, those make sure the statements. story is right, have... make sure that we're accurate and fair, that there isn't any libel um, or anything like that. 
The photos are another important aspect of the daily that accompanies the stories. Photos are an, an intention getter. I mean, when you're looking through the paper, you don't usually read it first. You look at the photos. That's what catches people's attention. Well, they put the, uh, put the newspaper reader into the story. It makes them feel like he's there. Before a student can become a daily photographer, a photojournalism class must be taken, and some photography experience is required. And once a member of the photo staff, the student must be prepared to put in a lot of hard work. The regular hours are 12.30 to 3.30, but I'm shooting always uh, before classes. Uh, when I'm not even on campus, you know, I'll just look for shots. Every day, the photographers get their assignments and then go out and shoot. Every aspect involved in processing a photo is done by the photographer, from developing to printing. Working on the daily staff is a way for students who are interested in photojournalism to gain experience. And I hope to be a professional photojournalist, and by working on the Spartan Daily, it'll give me the experience of being on some sort of paper before I go out and um, someday or this summer get you know an internship. I hope to get a lot of clips for a portfolio. I've already gotten a few, um, mostly just the experience. After the stories are written and the photos printed, editors have a budget meeting where they decide what stories are going to run, which ones are going to be held, and which ones will have photos. The daily editors make the decision for the stories. There is a give and take um, involving uh, the editors in budget. Um, most of the time, uh, a story will stand out as being good news. The main thing we look at is how not necessarily how many students will be interested in a story, but how strongly it affects the student body on campus. While the Spartan Daily editors make the decisions on the news stories, the photo editor decides on the pictures. I'm looking for the quality of the image, because usually when you reproduce in newspapers, the quality reduces very much anyway, so the negatives have to be very high quality. And also um, action in a photograph. Uh, very boring photographs or just don't have any action. So I look for some kind of action, whether it's small or big or exciting. And uh, emotion, lots of time we're, we're, we're shooting people. After the editors come out of the budget meeting, all the daily staff members gather in the staff room with a faculty advisor to critique the day's paper. In critique, students learn what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. It helps the staff members in different ways. It helps me first as an editor in that um, sometimes they catch things that we should have caught. Um, it helps the reporters um, in structuring their stories, in making sure that they have the facts in order. You write a story and you really don't know what the people out there think. So when the advisors get uh, to the story and in essence rip it apart, that's the best part because then you see what you did wrong and some of the things you did right. There's more to putting out a paper than just getting stories and photos. As with any newspaper, money is a necessary resource, and the Daily is no exception. The yearly budget for the Spartan Daily is more than $300,000. Even though it's a school paper, only a small amount is funded by the Associated Students. In some years, the Associated Students provide no funding at all. The Daily advertising staff is the major source of revenue for the paper. Members of the staff are responsible for selling advertising space in the Spartan Daily. In 1985, the advertising staff sold over $250,000 in advertising. On the average, ads in the daily take up 40% of the newspaper. Once the news stories, the photos, and the advertisements are completed, the paper is ready to go through the production process. The paper goes from an idea to something concrete. The stories are transmitted from the VDTs to the transferring VDT terminal. From there, the composing room supervisor sends the story to the digital typesetter, which sets type by laser. It acts like a camera by taking a picture of the story. I go over to the machine and I remove from the typesetting machine what has just been photographed, the story that's been photographed in digital type. And then from there, I take it and put it in the processor where it's developed. From there, the developed story is trimmed and given to the paste-up person. We wax them off through the waxer. So the back side is waxed, which is it's a mixture of half wax, half rubber cement. Um, we take it over and we look at the dummy sheets that have been drawn up for the page and take them and lay them down onto the flats themselves according to the dummies. Once the page is pasted up, it goes back to the daily editors where they check it over and make any necessary corrections. If a mistake is made, the article has to go through the digital typesetter again and then it's repasted up. From there, it's taken to the printers in the wee hours of the morning. Once it arrives, a picture is taken of each flat. 
and the printers work with the negatives. The negative is touched up so that there are no blemishes nor spots. The negatives are then put through a machine called a plate burner, which transfers the images onto an aluminum sheet, which is developed in the plate developer. The sheets of aluminum are taken to the presses, where the actual printing takes place. 10,000 copies roll off the presses. The cost to print each edition of the Spartan Daily is around $700. The finished product is delivered back to the campus by truck, where the papers are distributed to many campus locations, from which students pick up their copy of the Spartan Daily to find out what's happening and what's coming up on the campus. The Spartan Daily is known throughout California because it has won many awards. The exact count isn't known, but it's in the hundreds. They have been won in various newspaper competitions. In 1986, the Daily took first place for general excellence. This in the California Newspaper Publishers Association competition. And in the California Intercollegiate Press Association competition, it won the Sweepstakes Award. The Spartan Daily has been judged by professionals as one of the best college newspapers. It's one of the best, and it's one of the best because we have a good location here, we have a good department with good instructors, and we have good students who are motivated who come here and want to go out and become practical journalists. So they're ready, they come in with a certain amount of skills and we try to perfect them. The Spartan Daily staff and its faculty strive for perfection and newspaper students can be found in the upper echelons of the internship ladder. And most of our students now do two and three internships. And the payoff, as you can see, is in, for example, in the print journalism. This year we have students that are interning in, uh, we have one at the New York Times, we have one at the Los Angeles Times, one at the um, Long Beach Press Telegram, one at the San Jose Mercury News, one at the Providence Journal, we have one at the Milwaukee Journal, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few other. Those are some of the major papers, and I know that we have dozens more out of some of the smaller papers. Many students who are interested in a journalism career choose San Jose State as the logical institution to pursue that career. The awards won by the Spartan Daily demonstrate the high quality of instruction. Outside professionals repeatedly judge it to be one of the best college newspapers. Secondly, a degree from San Jose State is proof that you've been associated with award-winning journalism. Well, our people have been extremely successful. One reason is, and the employers have told me this many times, our kids go into an office expecting to have to go to work. Success in journalism comes down to hard work and determination. You'll have the opportunity to put this principle into practice when you're a Spartan Daily reporter. Dixie, what are you going to do when you get out? She said, I want to be a sports editor. Oh, Dixie, I said, a sports editor? I've never heard of a woman's sports editor. How are you going to get it? Oh, I don't know. I want to be a sports editor. So she went up to the Redwood Empire Journal as a sports editor. I mean, she just decided she was going to be a sports editor, and so she was a sports editor. Former Spartan Daily staff members are working at newspapers across the country. Several have won Pulitzer Prizes. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be extra smart. Just, just dedicated and determined. From uh, print journalism, we go to TV journalism. Night at San Jose State College. When classes are over, homework completed, and there's still a little free time to unwind from the day's tensions. The new fountain in front of Tower Hall offers needed relaxation for some, but for many students, the steadily flowing, never changing waters offer little consolation. What these students do at night is the topic for today, dancing. This is SJS Reports. I'm Jim Hemsworth. To live is to dance, says a famous cartoon character. And if state students are any indication, he's very right. At least once a week, some type of rock dance is held on this campus, usually with a live band. But why do so many college students today like to dance? Is dancing uh, simply an end in itself? SJS News went to a campus dance recently to find out.
music that, you know, the beat. That they, I don't know, maybe the rhythm of it. Oh, I don't think there's any meaning behind it. I think it's just, you know, just plain enjoyment. It's the beat, it gets inside of you, you know, you just have to dance. And it's, it's socializing, it's meeting other people. That's why you dance. It's in my blood, I guess. Because I like to dance. Why well, I don't say that much. I just enjoy dancing, always have. What are you folks from out here to Korak? Pardon? Why out here at Korak? I can't hear you. Why are you out here at Korak? Oh, I got through with my homework and I just felt like coming out. You like to dance? Yeah. Why is that? It's fun. A good way to get away from the books. Yeah. Is there any better way? No? How often do you come out here? Oh, about every two weeks. How about you? Do you why do you come out here to correct? Well, I just come out to study break. Especially to dance? Pardon me? Especially to dance? Oh, yeah, but just to get away, mainly. Because I like to meet people. Do you like to dance? Uh, no, not particularly. I'm sweaty and I'm uncoverable. And Why do you think most college kids do like to dance? Because they like to be hot and sweaty and like a lot of You walk down the street and start doing this, people stare. You do it on the dance floor with no lights on and people say, hey. It's no good, no good. That was sound, yeah, it makes it go. Fun. Oh, to get away from books. So that I don't have to study. I, I have a midterm Friday, you know, and I was kind of nervous and I wanted to get rid of my excess energy. There's nothing better to do here in this town. Watch people. And I like to dance. Dancing is fun, to be sure. And maybe that's a good enough reason to do most anything. If it's fun, and of course, uh, if it doesn't hurt others. Some people enjoy sitting in front of a fountain. Others like to express themselves more openly through dancing. It doesn't really matter. In this uh, rush, rush world of ours, with everyone trying to beat somebody at something, it's good to take time out and do what we truly enjoy most, just having fun. That's SJS Reports for today. I'm Jim Hemsworth. <laughs> Early. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you still feel the same way after that sound? <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure, Bob. Shifted to the guy that did the digitization as a parts machine to him in exchange for.
Officials say earthquake damage at San Jose State University may run an estimated $1.5 million. Stay tuned for this update news special report on the Bay Area quake. From the campus of San Jose State University, this is Update News, produced by San Jose State students in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications. University really came through this in very good shape. We were lucky. I'm, I, I feel very good about what's happened on this campus. We've handled this catastrophe on the best I could imagine it being handled. When it came down to this, we were all surprised at how well uh, it was handled. We just went in, did our jobs, made sure everybody was taken care of, made sure everybody stayed safe. Good morning, I'm Christina Schreck. And I'm Tim Wilson. People pulling together to recover from a massive earthquake. That's been the story everywhere in the Bay Area. And it's the same story on the San Jose State campus. This week, we're going to vary from our usual format and coverage to bring you a special report on the earthquake. The Bay Area continues to recover from the major earthquake. The 7.0 quake shook the region Tuesday at just after 5 in the evening. And since that time, people have been digging the dead out of the rubble, tending to the injured, cleaning up their businesses and their homes. Seven California counties have been declared disaster areas. While many areas have been hard hit, San Jose and the San Jose State campus community have been very lucky. On any given day, 17,000 students pour onto the university campus. Add to that 2,000 dorm residents, faculty, and staff. That gives the campus a daily population comparable to a small town. But San Jose State did very well for a number of reasons. Updates Christy Coleman is here now to tell us why. Christy? The university did did appear to be ready for an emergency. They've trained for such a day because they do realize that the campus population is the size of a small town. In fact, the university has disaster drills once a semester. For this earthquake, it seems to have paid off. Emergency vehicles were quick to respond at the San Jose State University campus. The fire department's hazardous incident team responded immediately to two reported chemical spills on campus. One of those was at Duncan Hall and one here at the old science building. One of the things that we do immediately in case of, of an emergency is to recall the experts and have them assess the situation. So we, we had very good cooperation in that regard. University Police Lieutenant Shannon Maloney says neither spill turned out to be serious. There are approximately 29,000 students enrolled at San Jose State. Within minutes, everyone was evacuated from the buildings. Outside on the open area of the campus grounds, students stood around, unsure of what to do next. UPD says there were only two reports of minor injuries. One student injured her hand when a large book fell on it. People were obviously shaken and uneasy. And a few people just ran around like they didn't know where to go. It was pretty scary. People didn't know where they were going. Everybody either headed for the door or the one large table in the front. After the door was congested and all the area of the table was filled, there wasn't any place for anyone else to go, so a large number of us just stood around or sat down and tried to finish taking our test. I didn't know what it was at first, but then I saw everybody running in their tables and things, and it was shaking more violently, so I... I knew it was an earthquake. What I did, I, I stand between the doorways at the building and I just stood there for about 30 to 40 seconds and earthquakes just still on. I mean, it just keeps going on and on. We checked with friends and said, are you seeing the same thing I am? And they, they said, yeah, this is, this is very incredible. After the initial shock wore off, many students began lining up at the phone realizing that the next step was to call home and let their families know that they were okay. As we found out later, people flocking to the nearest phone was not unusual. There was a line 10 people deep at every phone as we passed. The whole Bay Area was driven to calling someone somewhere and the lines were jammed for a long time. Christy, it seems many people were visibly shaken, but it didn't, doesn't seem like anybody really panicked. Is that what you saw when you were out on the campus? Yeah, that's true. Um, I think that although it seemed everyone seemed to have their head together still, the, there were incidents where I heard about hysteria, but the, most people seemed to be on the other end of the realm because they, 
they were too calm almost. They sat down in the middle of a, a test and tried to continue taking their test during an earthquake. Um, I think a lot of the reason why students at San Jose State were calm was because they just didn't realize the catastrophe in the rest of the area. Thanks, Christy. Good report. Thank you. Thank you. Many students were concerned about being evacuated during the earthquake. It's midterm time at San Jose State, and although the earthquake gave the students a break, next week will be tough. In Clark Library, the quake knocked off thousands of books to the floor. The library will be closed most of next week, so the books can be reshelled. It'll be a problem for students because Clark Library is the quietest place on campus to study. Students who planned on taking the GMAT test today are out of luck. The graduate entrance exam was scheduled to be given at San Jose State. But since the university is closed, no test will be conducted. However, the test is being given at Santa Clara University, but a transfer might not be available. San Jose State has been closed since the earthquake, like we had mentioned, and it's one of the few schools in San Jose that has stayed closed since Tuesday. San Jose State Public Information Officer Dick Staley says it was in the best of the students' interest. Well, two reasons, uh, two principal reasons. The first is, is that San Jose State brings about 17,000 people a day into the downtown San Jose area. The city, county, and other public safety and emergency recovery agencies are still at work, and so by minimizing the impact on the freeways and roads, uh, we're helping them. Also, access to the university is, is still somewhat restricted. Uh, Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, Interstate 280, uh, city and streets, uh, highways. There, there are problems with transportation and communications to the campus uh, via surface. We've also been asked to conserve on power and water by PG&E and the water utilities. So by minimizing the impact on the downtown area, we are helping the overall area recovery. This also gives San Jose State University an opportunity to thoroughly inspect all of our facilities to make certain that there is no major structural damage, that there are no gas leaks, that the buildings on this campus are safe for our faculty, students, and staff to occupy. So. Fortunately, San Jose State campus, like much of the rest of the city, hasn't suffered all that much. Facilities Vice President Mo Kaomi says he personally checked every building on campus, and he found no serious problems. Here with us now is Hank Henderson. Stop that one there. Facilities Vice President Mo Kaomi. Yes, the president of the university. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, state facility. So the next. Yeah. Exactly. So the next uh, couple of videos that I'm going to show are a uh, feature of uh, Valerie. Well, Valerie Dickerson became Valerie Coleman Morris, who's one of the. Well, she came out of SJSU journalism and went on to become an anchor at CNN. Um, so I'll play a clip of her reporting here on campus and then um, talking. The second one is really her talking about why you should donate to SJSU, but she in it, she talks about how um, her experience as a student impacted her. Um, the other thing to know about her, as among many other things, she was the first Black homecoming queen on campus. And she has an honorary doctorate at San Jose State. Yes, right. right. From the newsroom of the Department of Journalism and Advertising at San Jose State College, this is Campus Report. Good morning, I'm Valerie Dickerson sitting in for Jim Corcoran. That fight over control of the college newspaper isn't over yet. Student body president Jerry Spolter says he may veto the Publications Advisory Board bill just passed by student council. The staff of the Spartan Daily tried to persuade council members to postpone their final decision on the bill until a new proposal could be considered. But the council refused to wait and passed the measure Wednesday. Spolter warned council members that they were forcing his hand. Campus Report asked Spolter if he still plans to veto the control measure, and this is what he said. My feeling right now, since the vote was nine to seven, 
that uh, I may veto the uh, proposal, but in uh, so doing, I think uh, the only reasoning behind it would not be an objection to the bill as approved, rather uh, and, uh, to provide an opportunity for uh, further information gathering by the student council and its committees. Should the student president take this action as he strongly infers, council still has one alternative to override his veto by two-thirds vote. Meanwhile, in San Jose's rapidly approaching municipal election, the question of newspaper inter independence is also being debated. During a Junior Chamber of Commerce-sponsored debate in council chambers, Mayor Ron James told the audience that the Mercury News has every right to print any editorial stand they want. Mayor James's personal philosophy concerning the issue is there are no bounds restricting the printed news media. One of the busiest men on campus these days is Dean Ralph R. Cummings of the Admissions and Records Office. He's busy because the freeze has been lifted on admitting new students to San Jose State, and the mailbags are full every day with fresh applications. Dean Cummings and his entire staff are working extra hard because the work has piled up and there's no money for increased help. To handle the chore, the college temporarily has suspended the issuance of blue cards, the notices to students who are doing unsatisfactory work. This releases clerical help to work on the mounting stack of incoming mail. But it's not good news to poor students. Individual professors can still issue blue cards on their own. The common stereotype of a college professor is that of a man with a tweed coat, a pipe, and a book. Well, the campus saw different kinds of educators this week. And with that story, here's campus reporter Brahman Javed. It's not every day that San Jose State entertains educators dressed in medieval costumes. This week, we did. These are eight Roman Catholic nuns here as guests of the Newman Center, an off-campus religious organization. They're a pretty unusual group. Six of them hold PhD degrees. While on campus, the nuns lectured to various classes and met informally with faculty and students. One of them, Sister Mary Adele, is also a prize-winning photographer. Tomorrow, the nuns return to their respective colleges in various parts of California. Bam and Javid reporting. And now here with sports is our sports editor, Gary Price. Thanks, Valerie. San Jose State's baseball team sees action again tomorrow when it hosts Pacific in a doubleheader. The Spartans are coming off their biggest win of the year, a 7-5 upset victory over Santa Clara Wednesday. The win was especially pleasing to state coach Ed Sobzak and his team, considering that Santa Clara beat state 16-1 the first time the teams met this year. One of San Jose's top hitters against Santa Clara was second baseman Tony Hernandez. Tony collected three hits to break out of a recent batting slump. In track, San Jose State and Stanford meet in the area's big dual meet tomorrow. Varsity action gets underway at 1.30 on the Stanford track. Leading the Spartans will be world record holder Tommy Smith. Tommy owns the world marks in the 220-yard dash and the 200-meter dash with a time of 20 seconds flat. Two of the top field event men for State are Chris Papanicolo, a pole vaulter, and long jumper Ricky Rogers. Papanicolo has already gone 16 feet 6 inches this year, while Rogers has reached nearly 25 feet in the broad jump. And that's sports. Valerie? Sparta Camp reservations will be taken next week as students have a chance to spend a weekend of discussions and seminars in Osilomar. Sparta Camp Chairman Dick Wolf expects about 350 students to attend the April 15th and 16th event. Tickets will be on sale on 7th Street and next to the Spartan Bookstore. And that's Campus Report for March 31st. Good morning, this is Valerie Dickerson. This program has been pre-recorded by the Instructional Television Center.
when I think about giving, I can't do that without thinking about giving back to San Jose State University. And the reason is, everything really kind of started here. Let me just start by way of introduction. When I came to San Jose State, I thought I was going to be a pre-med student. I had been at another college, and my professor, after I got an F, not a C or a D, but an F on a chemistry exam, uh, gave it back to me, giving me a C grade passing, and he said the following. You wrote a dissertation and a story on the end of your chemistry exam, explaining the reason why you felt it wasn't necessary if you wanted to be OBGYN, that you understand chemistry. And he said, Valerie, do your passion. Your passion is writing. Your passion is recording. Your passion is knowing the information. Your passion is being a journalist. I carried that with me to San Jose State, where I declared my major as broadcast journalist. I then met Gordon Greb, who was the professor who really said to me, this is what you can do, and this is how you can do it. And he was the one who said, you must be professional from this moment forward. With that in mind, now that I do what I do, on any given day, on five networks with CNN, I go into 290 million homes, hotels, airports around the world. And how can I do what I'm doing today if I don't remember where that motivation came from? It came from here. Uh, and therefore, San Jose State will be remembered in my will. However large or small it may be when I leave this planet, this school will be remembered. It's going to be remembered so that I can make sure that other young people who come here knowing that they have a purpose and a sense of purpose, but need a little bit of direction or someone who can just help them sort it through. That's what one teacher did for me. And that's the reason why no matter where I go and whenever I come back here, I always make sure that I say his name and thank him. He gave me permission to understand that the job that I do could be my daily passion. I didn't know that before. I think that sometimes young people think what you do has to be tough and difficult. If it's really easy for you, then that's not being in the labor force and that's not being in the job market. With that, giving to me means giving back. Um, we can't abandon children in any way. And I think it's almost a sense of abandoning our children if we don't give back to universities. There are some who can't afford to be here. There are some maybe who don't need to be at a university like San Jose State. Maybe they need to be at a technical school or institution. But the idea is that learning costs money. It is an investment in our future. Moreover, it's an investment in our community. We cannot live in little pods of isolation and safety. If we give back to the community as a whole, especially to a school like San Jose State University, that is a community school. It's the little engine that drives the Silicon Valley. It's all of those things. We have to give back here so that we can make sure that we can live here and thrive here. So to me, giving is fundamental and giving is essential. And I hope that we can do it and that we pass along to our children the importance of giving being part of their life as well so that planned giving doesn't have to work quite as hard to convince everybody that it really is a plan for our future. That's the last of the films in this segment. And I would like to invite Richard Cray and Mike Corpus from the Spartan Daily and the journalism department to come have a seat here. Let me get the lights on. Oh, that's what I'm missing. So, uh, so Richard Craig is a professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Communications, and Mike Corpus is the production chief for the Spartan Daily. Um, so I'm hoping, and maybe starting with Mike, uh, that you can talk about how the kind of high caliber of student experiences with the Spartan Daily and journalism here on campus sets them up to go out into the professional world of journalism. Yeah, actually I can speak from a firsthand perspective. I'm a twice over graduate of our program now. Um, I transferred in the fall of 2003, or 2000 rather, fall of 2000 as an undergrad. 
went through our journalism program, graduated in 03. I was editor of the Spartan Daily that final semester. And then I came back. I've been working here for seven years and I just graduated my master's from our program last year. So um, I can say with pretty good divinity that uh, that our program really does set our students up for success, uh, giving them that real world feel of working in an, an actual working newsroom every day. Um, gives them the experience that they need to go out there and be successful. Uh, it did it for me, a whole bunch of our, my, my classmates, you know, we ended up in newspapers all over the country. I was at the Salt Lake Tribune. I worked at a small paper in South Dakota for a couple of years. I was with North Bay, the Republican Fairfield for about eight years, uh, covering everything from government to sports. And, uh, you know, I've got, you know, classmates who ended up Seattle Times, uh, Press Democrat, Santa Rosa. So it really, really does set us up, you know, for, for tremendous success. Our current Crops of students, you know, we've got one. She's an executive producer at NBC Bay Area at age 27. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it really does do a, a great job to uh, to set our folks up for success. Thank you, Mike. Do you want to add to that, Richard? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's always you, you see films like this and uh, and it kind of puts everything in it in a, a bigger picture context when we think about some of the folks that have come out of the program since I've been here uh, and looking at the films. Um, Frank Russell, who you saw uh, interviewed there, uh, Frank Russell worked at the Mercury News for years and is now a journalism professor at Cal State Fullerton. In fact, he's the new advisor for the Daily Titan. So he's kind of our editor, which is <laughs> funny. I talked to Frank two days ago uh, and uh, uh, Shelby Brad, we didn't actually see, uh, it was part of the video that we skipped, uh, was interviewed as part of the earthquake uh, edition of uh, Update. Shelby Grad is about the number two editor at the Los Angeles Times now. He's been there for 20 odd years. Um, so, so it's incredibly gratifying, um, to see that, uh, and, you know, it, it's, we feel like we're part of this continuum and you see this video and you really get a sense of that. You know, I see Bob Bain here and I hear Bob Reynolds and it is so good to hear Bob Reynolds voice. I have not talked to Bob in ages. He is one of my favorite people that has ever worked here at San Jose state. And, and I'm and just a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, so it shall also be noted, I, I was not in charge of this, but the Spartan Daily is covering this event. <laughs> uh, one of the, the editor assigned it and we just saw Angel show up and said, oh, you're covering this. So it's, so, uh, it's, it's very meta. So. Yes, it very it, it, I, I also kind of want to know where some of those award plaques are, because we have our current ones that we're very proud of. Um, one of the things that was mentioned in there was winning statewide awards. Uh, we just three weeks ago in Atlanta won the ACP Pacemaker Award nationwide uh, for best college media. We've won a couple of other national awards. And I happen to know because I just did a presentation in the, in the last seven years, we won 48 national awards and 131 statewide awards. Not brag here, <laughs> but none of that, none of that happened without all the groundwork that was, that was put in place by everyone that you saw in that video. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions from the audience? I'm sure Bob has questions. <laughs> or comments, mm -hmm. you know. The, the funny thing is, is that, well, to me, mm -hmm. is I see everything that's been accomplished here. I went to Idaho, mm -hmm. but we did the same things. Yeah. But we didn't win the awards. Well, but, I but that, that was the... Yeah. I went to school with some of the finest journalists in Idaho. Yeah. And they're of the same stature. And that's fine. Uh, having just been at this national convention, good journalism is still everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I brought back a bunch of examples. You can wander by the Daily Newsroom and see they're spread out everywhere um, of what other universities are doing throughout America. I mean, we're really proud of what we do here. Um, but in spite of sort of the public perception, um, this goes on everywhere. And I, I feel like we are a good example. We had a group from U Utah State. Utah State through. came by. Uh, the stu their student journalists came to check out our program uh, a few weeks ago when the football team was here. And you know, they talked to the folks from Update. They talked to a couple of folks from the Spear and from, uh, from the Daily as well and mm -hmm. kind of exchange ideas and such. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the cost to run the daily now? Mm, well, I wondered that too. The, the, well, the, the problem <laughs> the problem is that we stopped printing during COVID and we haven't had the money to restart with the exception of um, 
of special issues. We are putting a budget and a proposal together to go to the provost right now, and we're trying to figure out the budget. And it's interesting, they mentioned in the video the budget was $300,000 a year, um, but they were printing five days a week and they were printing much larger editions yeah. and they were printing 10,000 of them. So we are like guessing- $700 at, a day there. Yeah, so exactly. Um, now, a couple thousand? Um, yeah, yeah, something like that. Uh, uh, Berkeley, the Daily Cal was about to go under uh, last year and they had to pass a student fee of $6 per student per semester. We might have to do the same thing. I really hope that we don't. Our students. Uh, the the yeah. Daily Cal is a separate. I know. Student owned. Mm -hmm. It's separate from the, the university. Yeah. My wife used to be the general manager on mm -hmm. there. Yep. How about so. update news? What's the cost there? Update it. It's interesting. A lot of the a lot of the costs of update are sunk costs in that we were very fortunate to get a gift a number of years ago, and we spent eight hundred thousand dollars to take that old, the same room, um, that old uh, studio, and it is absolutely state-of-the-art 4K now. In fact, we we have rented it out to production companies to use. It, it's as good as it gets right yeah, now. We have better facilities than a lot of our students end up using when they go out. and Yeah, seriously. They, they end up disappointed a lot of times. Yeah. They walk into their new stations and, oh, this is older than stuff I learned on. Yeah, we actually, and, and the, the thing that I, that I will say, for us, I mean, we are sort of basking our students' reflected glory with all of this. What we try to do, and what, um, to be fair, what, what was done back then was try to create a culture where students feel like they can, they can learn, they can take chances, they can take the temperature of the rest of campus and come in and say, I think we ought to write about this. You know, I'm not the target audience for the Spartan Daily. Mike's not the target audience. Angel is the target audience over here, uh, but uh, but basically um, we try to create a culture where the students take ownership of this. It's very much like what everybody said in the video here that that um, you know I felt like when I came in and Bill Tellinghast, who you saw in the video, was still here when I got here. Um, I felt like the more I sort of took my hands off the reins, the better the paper got. And whatever that reflects on me, I don't know, but but I'm there and Mike is there uh, as kind of buffers against, you know, criticism that you get from the outside. We can critique the daily. We can tear them up and say, hey, you better be better about this, but it stays in the room. But they have the freedom to make a lot of their own decisions, to organize things, you know, and, and to come to us and say, we want to do this. I think it speaks to management. At any company in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. the best companies that produce the best products are those who have leadership at the top, who assemble a team and then step out of their way and let them do their jobs instead of trying to micromanage yeah. and control every little thing. Every and, yeah, and, and that's, Mike can speak to that. Yeah. That's really exactly how we run the daily. You know, at the end of toward the end of each semester, we will select the next executive editor. And we just went through we the just process did. last yeah. week. Yeah. Um, where you know, will the students will nominate individuals from amongst their 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 group, and then you know anybody who wants to go through the process will leave their name on the board. Anybody who doesn't, they take their name off, and then the next step of the process is the students will then choose the selection committee. So it's going to be Richard, myself, and then we typically go with three students who maybe aren't coming back or don't necessarily have skin in the game in terms of wanting to be editors next semester. And then we take written platforms from the candidates, we study those, and then we do a full interview process, 15 minute interview for each candidate. And then the five of us will knock our heads together and decide who's gonna be the next editor. Then that person selects their whole team for the next semester, the upcoming incoming editors. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the, in the midst of that process right now. Our next executive editor, Alina Tosh, she's taken applications for her editorial staff. Mm -hmm. And we go through that every semester. And that really gives full ownership to the students of the paper. We we constantly step back and tell them, this is your paper. You guys make the decisions here. Mm. We're just here to guide you and yeah. make sure you don't burn the place down. And the fact that uh, Mike here was executive editor of the Daily when he was a student, I think matters a lot because, you know, he, he understands, you know, that you have to work. This is San Jose State, not Stanford. Our kids all have to work. You know, they all have jobs outside. They all have other classes to take. They they put as much of the paper into it as they realistically can. But from my point of view, I mean, 
I don't want students making a bunch of mistakes they shouldn't make, but you have to remember they're kids. You guys are so young. Oh my goodness. This um, is a safe place for them to make mistakes so they can learn. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and have and having somebody here who who was in that chair not that long ago. Uh, Years, man. Really. <laughs> Uh, was there was there another hand up? Or? There was, but I'm yeah. have to call time in order to get on to the next segment. Right. Again, these are these are this whole day is really kind of um, mm -hmm. teaser tidbits of uh, mm -hmm. what you know all of this history yeah. <laughs> in all of on all of yes. these topics. And and we can we can carry on this conversation later. If anybody remains interested in the Spartan Daily, we're here all the time. Okay. Come by the newsroom. Come by the newsroom. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Richard yep. and Mike. Mm -hmm. Who do you work for in Salt Lake? Uh, Jim Halley, the sports editor, and this is the executive editor. Who's the publisher? Uh, Dean Singleton is just taking over the publisher. Okay. Yeah. And Jay Shelley. Jay Shelley. Jay, Jay Shelley is the constant here. Jay Shelley was the executive editor at the Moscow White Union when I interned there in college in 1980. And he had just been sent back to Idaho. Yeah. After that, yeah, yeah. After that. Yeah. So we're going to watch a series of three films that are just um, showing different perspectives on life on campus, with no expert commentary, just just to enjoy. No no panel uh, following this one. From the newsroom of the Department of Journalism and Advertising at San Jose State College, this is Campus Report. As you can see, this is not the newsroom in the journalism department. About the only thing that is the same, this is still Campus Report, and I'm still Jim Corcoran. This program is the first of what we hope will be many specials about the San Jose State campus. Today we're going to tell you about the mess that surrounds the college's best known landmark, Tower Hall. A few years ago, the area right behind me was probably the most beautiful spot on campus. It was lined with grass, palm trees, shrubs, and walkways. It was a place where students could go to find a little tranquility amidst the hustle and bustle that is college life. Now only a faint memory of the quad remains, as construction workers are back again. Only this time not to destroy, but to try and recreate the beautiful area that once surrounded Tower Hall. But the history of this area is more than one of destruction and recreation. It begins back in the spring of 1963, when the Board of Trustees ordered the destruction of the whole Tower Hall complex. For two years, the buildings were vacant, while administrators haggled over which part of the complex would be destroyed. Only a telegram to Sacramento containing 2,000 signatures saved Tower Hall and Morris Daly Auditorium. The rest had to go. And in the spring of 1965, it went. The walls of the complex stood for the last time during semester break. Construction crews moved in while the school was vacant so as to lessen the shock to the college community. When the bulldozers left, the area around Tower Hall was a wasteland. Under the sun, it was a hot and dusty, while rain transformed it into a muddy impasse to scurrying students. Again, administrators haggled over what to do. The focal point of the campus had to reflect the beauty of the school, so planners began revamping. Again, the bulldozers and workmen moved in, this time to build up rather than to destroy. The project? A complete landscaping of the flatland around Tower Hall. It's just one phase of a giant master plan to make the largest school in the state college system one of the most picturesque. Well, that's pretty much the recent history of the Tower Hall mess, at least up till now. But what about the future? Will this new Tower Hall be as pretty as the old one? About the best person who could tell us that is the man overseeing the entire project. Dean Grant Burton. Right now, he's over there talking to Dave Silverbrand. Dean Burton, what are some of the highlights of this project? Well, Dave, one important aspect of the completed project will be a formal pattern of tree-covered walkways that will be reminiscent of the wings of the old building that were torn down. Another will be the 20-foot, 25-foot, uh, that is, wide brick promenade leading to the main entrance of the building. Still another, the fountain uh, to which the students contributed. 
and a fourth the orchard at the back of the project which will consist of uh, flowering crab apple trees. How much will the project cost when completed? Approximately $127,000 at construction level. And when will the project be completed? The contractor was given five working days, or, or five months of working days. This would uh, carry it through to, oh, July 10th or so. But he has told us that uh, he'll try, if at all possible, to complete the project during the month of May. Do you think that the completed project will approach the beauty of the original quad? Well, the original quad was a beautiful area. I think that this project will be a beautiful thing when it is completed. It will be something different, however. Thank you, Dean Burton. That's it from here. Jim? Well, I hope within the short time that we've had, we've brought you up to date on the history of this temporary mess. I also hope we've, some, we've given you something to look forward to in the very near future. In any case, this area right behind me, as full of water and mud as it is, will do a great deal in making San Jose State look like a real college. Tomorrow, I'll be back in the newsroom with our regular edition of Campus Report. Until then, this is Jim Corcoran. Good morning. This program has been pre-recorded by the Instructional Television Center. Stand by in case someone drops. Hey, Helen of Troy is a beauty. She really is. A very attractive girl. about that processional music? Notice I've got a few replacements standing by in case somebody falters carrying the uh, Trojan horse. Well, they really look like they're struggling under that. Wow, what's Here's the up? most colorful one we've seen thus far. This is constructed by Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity and the Alpha Phi sorority. And it characterizes the ever-present threat of the bad man of the Old West to the uh, law-abiding citizen. That, by the way, is, is kind of a rosy pink smoke being uh, belched out, as it were, by the locomotive. There's, a, there's the villain. There's the villain right there holding out his hand with the threatening the mortgage holders on the old homestead. Cornell is going to have certain death. It's a potent smoke, too. <laughs> it, it is indeed. instead of authenticity. This is the Matador boarding house. Riding in the back of a pickup truck, the house members are dressed in characteristic western garb. That's the west we know and love today, huh? This is another one I know very little about, Ross. Blue Key, what's this? Well, Blue Key is a national service, an honorary organization for men here at San Jose State. The members entering the exclusive Blue Key Club must be upper division students and hold a grade point average in the upper third of their class. So Blue Key is a very exclusive club, and the president is Frank Bardsley. Unlike Black Mask, they're not uh, secret. And the old fire engine. Oh, yes, the awful, awful. favorite student hangout on uh, South First Street, Monterey Highway. Bucket seats, yes indeed. There's the uh, Bookser High School Band directed by Donald Karras and is led by drum major Mike Marshan. This award-winning Bruin band features majorette Cindy Ross and head Bruinette. Bruinette, how about yeah, that? how about that? Marty Hickman, and she's decked out in, it's all decked out in red, black, and white. Bookser High School Band is the current champion in the Santa Clara Parade of Champions. That's no small um, undertaking, winning the uh, Santa Clara Parade of Champions. They had literally dozens of high school marching bands, drum and bugle corps from all over the state participating in that. So it's quite an honor for this Bookser High School Band. That's the tradition of march music.
marching in a flying wedge, doing a little dancing there. Look like the books are high review. Indeed. Pretty majorette. It makes me want to get up and start marching. Down, girl, down. <laughs> Another facet of life on the frontier is pictured here by Sigma Nu Fraternity. The brothers catch the flavor of the West as they show the cowboys relaxing at their favorite watering hole. <laughs> Dancing girls and the college's mascot, Sparty, are on hand to provide entertainment for the weary cowboys. That's the most pathetic scene. <laughs> They don't look that weary either. Yeah, they look uh, in the old right west. In. What's Barney doing in there? That's hardly western attire with a toga and the, uh, the Spartan helmet. Just shows how versatile Sparty is. Right. He's just in there entertaining them. <laughs> gorgeous group of girls and punks of men. I'll never know where San Jose State got the reputation as being a party school. <laughs> and this might be a very good time for us to break briefly for station identification. We'll return to San Jose State Homecoming 1965 in one minute. forward 10 years, 1975. don't do things well, or we don't do it right, or we don't do it on time, or whatever. Until we get to be adults, and we have we've taken all that in, New College was started by a group of faculty and students because they were dissatisfied with what is commonly called smorgasbord education. A little of this and a little of that, and when you put it all together, it doesn't make any sense. Where that people need validation, everybody does, that is positive strokes. So they got together and decided this would be a community of learning. We would all sit down and learn together. What I'd like to do now is some exercises to get us in touch with how difficult it is to give validation to people. How difficult it is to receive it. Every year, New College is a different Who place because the students people. change every year. The first one is called a can validation, and it's just for fun. It, we it's don't kind of an plan our programs like the year before, can, like other departments. We plan our better. program in the few weeks before that semester begins and in the first few weeks so that it is important to what's going on to those students that particular year. You have to say to him or her, I'll bet you were adorable when you went back. <laughs> and when he hears that, you have to accept that validation by saying, I was. <laughs> but you should see me now. Oh, no. <laughs> the lower division program is a general education program which fulfills all graduation requirements. Um, in the lower division, the program is very structured. Uh, the first semester is called The Nature of Being Human, and we study what is unique about being a human being. In the spring semester, we study the environment. Third semester, the units are cut to 10 units so that students can begin to do independent work, upper division work, but the lower division work is spent on a sort of a study of politics and society. And in the fourth semester, we study the future. Uh, most of the time is spent in seminars, though there are a few lectures every week. There are no letter grades in the lower division. It's all credit, no credit, but extensive evaluations are done by the faculty on each of the students. Who do you need validation from as a... The upper division program is a student-directed major. Each student puts together her or his own major program, uh, which culminates in a senior thesis in the senior year, 
which is an independent project, which is just a project that's very special to the student. It's sort of, you know, this is my piece de resistance of my college career. The most structured thing you can do with a degree from New College is become a teacher. We're one of the six approved teaching majors on the campus. And we're the only teaching major where you can take all of your coursework in New College. Outside of that, it's a general liberal arts degree. I personally have seen students go on to masters in social work, law school, graduate work in history, sociology, English, political science, I think are the ones that come to mind most strongly in the social sciences. That is that is our biggest strength. Our students end up in a lot of the community service and social service areas because during their upper division especially, we encourage students to go out in the field and get field work experience. They have to have some experience outside of classroom learning situations so that by the time they graduate, they're already in. Um, my students are the only ones I know who, who know plenty of places to go for jobs once they graduate. Most of them have jobs before they graduate. Write the names of four people who need validation from you. Okay, and write their names my students are friends. Maybe that's because there's such a variety. It's not like you have one kind of student coming in there. A lot of classes are held at home. We have a lot of get-togethers, potluck suppers. We love to eat together. I swear, everybody gains a lot of weight over there because there's a lot of communal activities. Once we go through the first semester and we know these students, they help us to plan what will go on in succeeding semesters. And, and we try to go with where that particular class's interests are going. Now what I want you to do on the inside is to write what kind of validation you think this person needs from you, whether you're willing to give it to them or not. Yes, we're looking. We're always looking for interesting people. Um, but there seems to be a self-selection. We get the people we want, but we're always looking for more. I mean, it can't be general. They want time, they want attention, they want love. <laughs> Would they like to be the first one? Okay. I'll take off. <laughs> And that concludes that segment. If you've been here to see three or more segments, which at this point we've had three segments, please consider taking home a prize. <laughs> uh, we have tote bags and scarves uh, if you would like. Um, I was really excited to find that New College clip because New College is part, one of the things researchers reach out to us a lot for information about the history of that program. And so that's really a gem having that. So Carly, the uh, yes. narrator, Cindy Margolin's our neighbor. And <laughs> <laughs> she eventually, became, she eventually became undergraduate study student here. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, the continuity of all of this. And I think uh, she still has some information. I'll talk to her about it. Her okay. Okay. Uh, that would be great. Um, so the next series of films, there's going to be two just about um, the performing arts department, similar to the last film we saw. Um, these new student counseling films were just made to let students know some of the things they could study here. So we'll watch one on music and one on dance. And then um, a series of dance performances from, I believe they're from 1970. Make sure I play the right ones in the right order. The students who are music majors are different. 
They are different in that um, their career is their life. Most musicians are 24-hour musicians. They spend time during the day teaching, in the afternoon perhaps practicing, and at night they're usually at a rehearsal or at a performance. So it is a person who is busy making music most of his life. The life of a musician uh, has to have great rewards or people wouldn't do it. Yeah, all right, Art. Very good. Most musicians are in music because of the constant satisfaction they receive in, in the sheer joy of making music. We exist to train people to become musicians. And yet when I say become musician, um, probably the people who come to us already are musicians. Uh, the traditional music student begins his career somewhere along about the second, third, or fourth grades on both his instrument and his uh, appreciation for and involvement in music. So that he comes to the music school with a broad background, or at least a specific background in an instrument. Oh, don't change. That would be very beautiful if you can make completely yourself then what we try to do is take that person and fill in all of the gaps that he did not get with his own private teacher or in his involvement in his school program so that he has the broad basis of understanding and musical skills that he needs in order to function in the musical world. The fifth bar of one. Um, by and large, a musician must be able to make music, and that means that he, he must know music of all periods, of all styles, uh, by composers of all different kinds of music and he must know how to make music with others because very few musicians make money by themselves. Right, he generally finds the, the most lucrative areas for his talent in group music making. For example, um, combos, stage bands, uh, nightclub acts, uh, symphony orchestras, opera, great choirs, including church work. Many soloists and church choir musicians are earning a living or at least partial income from church work. Many of our students, um, well in fact most of them do take private lessons. They're required to study their own instrument with a private teacher so that he has both very large group experiences and experiences on a one-to-one -one basis with his teacher. In fact, uh, except for the large performing organizations, our classes are probably as small as any anywhere in the university. The students do receive a great deal of individual help. They get to know their teachers quite well and the teacher gets to know the student quite well and what his needs are. There are never enough good players. And so although there are many people around that don't have as much work as they want, generally they're the people who aren't the best. The top player in his instrument, the top musician, can always find an adequate market for his skills. It's very hard to define dance for any one person, but for, for any of us, dance is, is something that you have to do, that you can't not do it.
that dance does have many faces, uh, to use an old term. You find your own place within the discipline. If dance is something you have to do, you'll have to do it and find your place in it. We have people coming through with the dance major who have no intention of dancing because they're not performers. But the discipline is such that they intend to use it in therapy or as historians or as researchers or perhaps you know, the, 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 the uh, professions are in these critics. And uh, as well as the teaching, teaching probably many people think toward teaching first if they don't feel that they want to go into a professional life, which is a gypsy life. And it's tough, and it doesn't pay very well. But uh, for those people who are dedicated, and I, I don't know if that's a good word to use or not, but that's, well, that's what dance is all about. Presently, you can concentrate and become what we call a modern dance major. We have two levels of ballet to support this, and we have three levels, oh gosh, more than that, beginning advanced, beginning intermediate advanced, and some others in the, in the ethnic areas. We have three levels of composition, but they're all in a modern dance area. So if someone is interested in something else other than modern dance, this is not the right place for them. Uh, it's more possible now for, to accommodate those people who come in who are interested in the theater, musical theater, and theater is a total art form, which I find very exciting because we have, uh, you, know, you know, we can share facilities better than we could when we were different schools. Um, but generally speaking, we're trying to build up in the ethnic department. I would like to see uh, people coming here to dance in the ethnic areas, and we have some uh, specialists in this area that are really very good. I've seen them perform and they're really, really excellent. But this is the area for it. This is a part of the country, a part of the state anyway, where there's a high concentration and why not have excellent dance forms. We do two or three concerts a year uh, for any student. It's not, they don't have to be dance majors even. It's those who are majors who are concentrations in this area are usually better because they spend more time at it. But we've certainly had our share of dancers who were business majors or journalism majors or a lot of things, and that I expect that to continue because it doesn't have to be a narrow sort of world for the person dancing. Um, you can count on doing uh, once a year at least, if not more often, a major production with the theater arts department too. Uh, music people are always looking for choreographers for the operas and for small th group things and uh, I suspect that we haven't explored all the possibilities for working with choral groups either, but there, there have always have been and there will continue to be more interrelated kinds of things. So if your interest is in making dances rather than being in dances, then there's opportunity this way too. We get lots of calls from local high schools and community theater. Some are paying, some are not, some are good for experience, and some are worth $50 or anywhere from there to a reasonable fee uh, to work in making dances for musicals, for instance, it seems to be They're very popular in this valley. Um, we don't offer too much in the way of children's dance, only one course, but through this course pass people who are preparing for elementary education, and, as well as dance specialists, and there seem to be more and more of those. I think people who go into performing arts are sort of a special breed anyway, because they're willing to carry the regular load of real people and still go into the world of you know, the unreal or the theater world. And uh, uh, they're, they're just different kinds of people. And, and uh, sometimes people come in very, very young and very excited about dance and don't really know what it's all about. And maybe that's what we serve to, to do that. And I never felt that we have wasted time with anybody anyhow, because I felt if I've been doing nothing else, I've been educating an audience. And without an audience, the performing arts will not survive anyway. Dance and the drama students should both benefit greatly from the joining of dance to the department because it will permit the dance students to get more production training uh, in a theater atmosphere uh, for that aspect of their work. And it will permit the drama students uh, to have more and better basic movement training, 
which along with voice and the development of the inner resources are the basics of performance. So that theater arts is, consists of three very distinct and special areas, but which are interwoven in practice uh, in the department, and the student has the opportunity of combining them in various ways if he wishes in obtaining his degree.
I holy vine mea ika ihe akamakani. Ole, ole vine mea ika ihe akamakani. Ha mai na ale ka ki bu bu bu. Ela u kalai hi do e he anu. I o o kana he le o mai bi e ku aku la kamala na ya ka ki bu bu bu. Dalu kamaka i ka o ha mai ya. Yes, 
för vi är vad de heter till den yngling jag älskar. Till min fru som jag älskar. Till pojken jag älskade. Till flickan som jag älskar. Ja. These were from these dances were from the uh, spring orchestra's concert, and then they just re videotaped them. And I was stage manager. Oh my goodness! Thank you for that context. I'm going to ask to put that in an email to me, so okay. I don't have my my pencil with me. Yeah, all I all I knew is that they were recording some dance performances from the 1970s. So. Yeah, we used to do a big spring concert. In '70, we did the concert both up in the in the room where these were videotaped. And we were also at the theater out in Los Gatos. They had a Shakespearean oh, theater. Yeah. Because all the fans used to be in what was physical education. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. So you had that you had to have a modern dance class and you had to, you know, do some stuff with modern dance. So yeah. I started as an usher the next year. I was on the light staff and I was on the stage crew and I was stage manager. Okay. All right, we're gonna only gonna watch um about 10 minutes of the next set of dances. Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
I was I grew up in a modern dance school. So all of even though this is all of this is about ten well and really fourteen years before I would have been in the school as a dancer. I I like all of it from like the crushed velvet to to yeah. you know yeah. the deep contraction very familiar to me. Well, my name is to perform in New York before she came to San Francisco State.
Okay, well, step out of that one and on into our next segment. Will you turn on the lights for the next one? Um, so our next segment is about the history of athletics, which is a nice segue because there were connections between the dance department and the physical education department or the dance program, I guess, in the physical education department. Um, before we start the next film, I believe Dr. Shirley Reiki was going to give us an introduction. Is that true? I believe so. Okay, wonderful. So introducing Dr. Shirley Reiki, who is a professor in kinesiology teaching the history of sport and, and physical activity and is also the author of the book Bean Bags to Bod Pods about the history of the kinesiology department. You want to come up here? <laughs> the, that is the sound device for the okay, people online. I probably managed that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. The first film is from 1975 and in 1975 as I'm sure lots of the audience know uh, women's physical education and men's physical education were separate, and women's physical education still housed what was called women's athletics. There were about 300 majors, as I think the film says, and most of them, not all, but most were going to go into teaching. It was just the beginning of changing over from everybody being in teaching. I think that's all we need at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, will you the like? Thank you. Hi, Chris. And by the way, her name's Lita Walter, singular, not Walters. Typo. Typo, yes, or writer. Typo. <laughs> I used to always make that mistake. Yeah, lots of people do. Mm. Uh, the physical education curriculum is primarily designed around the teaching credential. However, there are several other uh, offshoots that people can take advantage of in this particular field. Uh, namely, adaptive physical education work, which may or may not be done in the public schools. Um, of course, coaching after schools, things of this nature. Um, corrective therapy is a field that is beginning to develop for us. More and more students, of course, are, are taking their background work in physical education going on to graduate school fields of kinesiology, physiology of human movement. And others are going into their own private businesses, such as gymnastics clubs, tennis clubs, swimming clubs. The teaching credential program uh, is done within the four-year curriculum and the four-year pattern. And those students, of course, as part of their 124 units for graduation, do 21 to 24 units in education courses, including their student teaching. People have shied away from the teaching profession, knowing full well what is out there. We still believe that, that good teachers are going to find jobs. They may not find the ideal job for the first year or two, but if they shop around a little bit and get out into the hinterlands, where sometimes it can be more fun, uh, they're finding jobs. A large number of students have picked up part-time work. They're either going into the substitute teaching and, and getting in the door that way, or they're picking up the part-time work on the, the coaching basis. One of the things that we think is uh, a strong point within the program is that the student, uh, no matter what direction they want to go within physical education, has the opportunity to build their own program. It's highly individualized. That's why we stress a great deal upon working directly with an advisor in this program. We probably have around 300 women in the department now as majors, and I doubt very much that any two are on the exact same program. They can go uh, strongly in certain activity areas, certain directions in activity areas. They can go strongly in certain directions theoretical as well. They can go either scientific, they can go philosophical, they can go into um, aquatics as an emphasis, they can go into gymnastics as an emphasis, individual sports, team sports. Then they do supplemental work in other areas, so they are not so narrowly prepared that they're worthless. Uh, they can go out with a good solid background. And if they are so inclined, they can be a generalist. There are lots of people that feel that you go into physical education only because you're an athlete. And this is, is a misnomer. 
there are many fine teachers who were never strong uh, activity-wise. They have a, a strong feeling for the student in activity. They may not be a strong performer themselves, but we're working with people. And uh, this is, is what's so very important to the student who may be questioning slightly. Now, granted, it does help to be able to perform well because we have to demonstrate in many cases. We're the only source in many cases to set the example. So uh, we do draw strongly upon our ability to demonstrate, but words can do it in many cases. And understanding, that's what's important. <laughs> Good. How did you know what it is? Next film is uh, an update news report from 1988, uh, which will be the center of the discussion that we'll have in a moment. There's bad news for some San Jose State sports programs. The university's new swimming pool has been delayed once again. And in sports, the Spartan baseball team ends their season on a winning note. These stories and more are coming up on this week's edition of Update News. From the campus of San Jose State University, this is Update News, produced by San Jose State students in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications. Good afternoon. After eight months of consideration, the decision has finally been made. Four San Jose State sports will be cut from the athletics program. Men's wrestling, cross country, track and field, and women's field hockey will no longer exist as of next year. Athletic director Randy Hoffman proposed the cuts on the basis that the four sports are the least viable in the program. Obviously the decision to eliminate those sport programs were, was not an easy one. Uh, it's one that the university has wrestled with not for a short period of time, but for eight months. Uh, we've been preparing information uh, for the athletics board and the university for that period of time. Hoffman says the cuts are not the result of a budget deficit, but instead they're aimed at consolidating existing resources in order to give student athletes a well-balanced program. Is more specifically a vote for increasing the integrity of the entire program, uh, something that I feel very strongly about. I think that any student athlete that comes to San Jose State University uh, should have a very positive experience here. Uh, they should be able to um, be retained and graduate uh, at a high level. Uh, they should leave as productive citizens and they should have uh, just a good feeling about the overall university. Wrestling was a sport that was suspended two years ago, but it was reinstated under the condition that it would be funded by an outside source. According to Hoffman, the funding was inadequate. The track and field program, including cross country, once was a powerhouse sport, but Hoffman says there's a lack of funding and the program is too expensive to operate. We'll be finding out how a couple of these programs are dealing with the bad news later on in our sports report. The opening of San Jose State's new swimming... And now to tell us about sports is our own sports producer, Mike Geeser. Mike? It hasn't been an easy week for sports at San Jose State. The decision to cut four sports from the athletic program at San Jose State has affected a lot of people. Three head coaches, three assistant coaches, and 80 student athletes will be affected by the cut. Update Steve Wright takes a look at one program that is being dropped. Bud Winter, Tommy Smith, Lee Evans, and John Carlos. Those names are just a few in the long and rich history of San Jose State track and field. The key word in that sentence is history. San Jose State's track and field team, resulting from the school's budget cutbacks, is now history. Speed City, as State's track program was once known, had one of the strongest programs in the nation under coach Bud Winter's 30-year tenure. But track and field, as well as Bud Winter Field, have fallen on hard times. Um, track obviously is in definite need of refurbation. Um, facilities out there. And this has been a problem for some time. Uh, 
and I think this is one of the major considerations is that there is has not been the revenue to put back into the track program that would bring the track up to the level and of uh, or standards that are necessary for competition. Um, you've been out there, you've seen the bleachers, you've seen the track, and it's really a safety problem out there in some respects. Um, Coach Marshall Clark thinks the timing of the decision wasn't good at all, especially since his team had been improving. Uh, when I took over as a head coach in 1984, again, we did, we suffered some position losses. Uh, kind of a steady downflow of, of funding, and that's where it's been. But I think the thing is we could live with this as long as we were able to be able to go out and get, you know, have a direction with some athletes. And I, we felt that over the past four years that we have turned, turned the program around for the kind of people we have in it as students, what our prospects were for next year, what was returning, and what the kids that we had recruited this year. That's why this was a tremendous jolt uh, when it occurred. I think it reflects poor leadership in the administration at this university. Just simply uh, getting rid of the problem, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's making it easy for themselves instead of trying to solve it and, and make it a better program. I think uh, San Jose State has a potential of having, you know, one of the best track programs in the nation. And it would be a shame to, to just drop it. The history of San Jose State's track and field has produced 41 Olympians. But next year, if there is no track and field program, it will be very hard to add to that number. Reporting for Update News, I'm Steve Wright. The elimination of these four athletic programs reduces San Jose State's intercollegiate sports program from 18 to 14, seven men's and seven women's NC2A sponsored sports. Update Susan Edwards takes a closer look at the women's sport being dropped. Women's field hockey was the only women's sport terminated. The team has been part of the San Jose State Athletic Department for over 13 years. The team's placed as high as third in the nation in 1978 and fourth in 1980. Athletic Director Randy Hoffman proposed that the team be terminated. Uh, the women's field hockey team um, has a tremendous coach, a great team. Uh, they've been very successful on a national basis. Uh, the reality of it is that there's not a lot of field hockey being played on the West Coast. There's five institutions. Uh, it's primarily played back on the East Coast. Um, it's difficult and expensive from a travel standpoint. Um, and I think they were the reasons why that sport was, was rated so lowly. Team members were upset about the announcement. Earlier in the week, they had tried to plead their case to University President Gail Fullerton. She's making this decision at such a late point in time when it's too late to apply to another school and to apply for another scholarship. And plus, if we transfer at this point in our lives, uh, we'd be losing credits and units, and we'd, it'd put us back in our college education. And a lot of us are on scholarship and might not even be able to afford to transfer to another school. Those who are on a scholarship and were anticipating a scholarship next year, it is my understanding that they will be given an option of having some comparable amount of money that they will be able to earn as a student assistant uh, so that if their choice is to remain and, and work on their uh, academic program, uh, and I would hope that would be their major priority, that they will have uh, a similar amount of money available to them if they choose to do that. Carol Lewis has been the field hockey coach for six years. Well, as a coach, it's a very stressful uh, situation right now. We're trying to rally our team. You don't like the, the team to have its self-esteem and really get down. Our whole team feels really let down with this whole administration by Gail Fullerton. She won't talk to us. Um, I just don't think there's a viable reason for cutting us. For Update News, I'm Susan Edwards. Representatives from the four teams are planning to hold a press conference Monday in hopes of rallying support. San Jose... Right. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so joining uh, Shirley up here on the panel will also be Carolyn Lewis. <laughs> who you just oh, saw. Was Carolyn. <laughs> 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 please, please come on up and have a seat. Um, so Carolyn Lewis is a field hockey coach during that time, as you saw. 
and um, also taught in the physical education department and was the assistant administrator for intercollegiate sports in 1988. Thank you both for being here. Um, maybe just start with your initial reactions to watching that those pieces of history. <laughs> well, I just want to say by this time, uh, women's athletics and was totally out of kinesiology as it is now. And there were some coaches who were still teaching in kinesiology. So there was a link. But we knew absolutely nothing about this. And I think what's important to announce is uh, what's important to say is that this decision was announced on dead day. What a brilliant day to decide. Spring, no, spring semester. Spring semester dead, dead day, day. No students on campus right about to go into exams. If you want to announce something controversial, what a brilliant day to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now your reaction. Yeah. So um, I actually came in 1975 for the first video. I was an undergraduate here and I played sports and I was part of the physical education department. I was hired back in 1975 as the head women's basketball coach and the assistant field hockey coach. And I had to also teach half time. So I was coaching two sports, teaching half time. The instructor in the video, the volleyball instructor, she was my assistant basketball coach. She also was the assistant volleyball coach. And she taught halftime. So that's what we had to do when we were coaching. Uh, comparable men's coaches basically taught a third, maybe halftime in the men's athletic program, but they had assignments to pull out, fill out their job in the men's PE class. Going forward now to 1988, I was the assistant athletic director. I was an assistant athletic director. So there was a Athletic director, Randy Hoffman, who was hired to drop sports, we found out later. That's what Gail Fullerton's intent was when she brought him in. Um, there was a senior associate athletic director who had been the women's athletic director two years before when we had we were forced to merge. And then there was an assistant on the men's side and an assistant on the women's side. I held the women's side. The eight months of study that they did, <laughs> they did it off campus somewhere in private. Um, here I am an athletic administrator, but I was a coach too. So I guess that's why they did it. Kept everything in secret. Never asked me or any of the other coaches, we're considering maybe your sport, give us some input. No, no input was ever put together. <laughs> The couple of fallacies in the premise of why to drop sports. Track had a bad track. The field itself was bad. Uh, a few years, not a few years later, but while I was still working at San Jose State in athletic administration in the 1990s, 2000, they decided to start bringing track back. And track was brought back. We still don't have a track. We are very strong. We have an All-American in our track program now. Uh, they, This athletic administration in the past, most recent past ones, found a way how to use San Jose City College and other tracks, and they're going to be building a state-of-the-art track at the county fairgrounds. So the premise that track wasn't, it was competitive when it was dropped. Mm -hmm. And field hockey was very competitive when it was dropped. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to stress. The four things that was dropped were incredibly successful programs. And I've been fortunate to go to quite a lot of other countries. And as soon as you say San Jose State, everybody does that mm -hmm. because that's what they know about San Jose State was Tommy Smith and John Carlos in 1968. And that program was just dropped yeah, out of the blue. And it caused a lot of hard feelings. Now, on the women's side, which I'm here to speak for, mm -hmm. my field hockey program had 28 players. We were the top academic team in the entire athletic department, had the best graduation rate. So academics wasn't our problem. Uh, when they decided to drop women's field hockey, we lost 26% of all the female athletic participation in athletics. So they justified, we have seven men, we have seven women it's teams. It's equal, everybody. Mm -hmm. But the reality was that 74% of all athletic participants were male. Title IX was passed in 72. Took a, almost eight years before they 
started to say in 1978, you need to be equal. They had to figure out how to, the government and the universities and the NCA and everything had to figure out how to have equality between a male and a female. So by 78, unfortunately, the Supreme Court passed the Grove City decision, which basically took athletics out of Title IX. And how they did that was no federal funds go directly to athletics except for student athletes that get Pell Grants. Mm -hmm. So there was no enforcement in athletics. Mm -hmm. Program was dropped in 88, 92, Gwinnett versus uh, Franklin was another Supreme Court decision. And guess what? Athletics came back in. Mm -hmm. There was now people to, you could sue and force universities to have equality. But different definitions of equality. Right, of different definitions, but it's, at least there was a little more equality. And by 92, the NCA decided that, hey, we can make some money on, on women's sports. Because in 88, um, the NCA was fighting, still somewhat fighting. We were in NCA sport, but they still were not contributing as equally to women's sports. I can remember Mary Zimmerman, who was the director of women's athletics, coming into my intro to physical education class, as it was in those days. And I said to her, do you think it's a good idea if women's athletics goes into the NCAA? And there was a huge division of opinion. Some people thought women needed to control women's sports, and other people thought if women's athletics went into the NCAA, they'd get more money. Well, if anybody followed what happened in basketball in the collegiate situation about two years ago, when there was this big coverage of the men's uh, weightlifting was a massive gym with vast quantities of equipment, and the women's provision was about three barbells. So even up to two years ago, it wasn't exactly something that the NCAA was pouring money into. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the saddest part was as coaches of those four sports in February was a scholarship signing time. And we were all given our allotment of how many scholarships to sign. And I had signed six new players coming into San Jose state on scholarship. Okay. And that's where the real, really bad, the, they talked about, President Fullerton talked about the students that were on scholarship. They could have equal amount, but they had to work for it. They had to go be a student assistant or work in the locker room or something. The six that I signed in February, they had a national letter of intent, which committed them to San Jose State. In May, when they dropped the sport, yeah, they were free to go somewhere else on scholarship. But the reality is in May, all the other schools basically had all their scholarships locked up. Yeah. I had two players, one that was Tina, the, the blonde that was talking, second to the last. She went to UOP because UOP had a player who dropped out, decided not to go to school, and so they had a scholarship. So she was able to, and my other Tina, I had two Tinas on the team, she was able to go to Iowa because they had the same thing. They had a scholarship that became available at the last minute, but four of the others basically, you know, had a scholarship to go to college, planning to go to college, and it was ripped from them, and the school didn't even honor those commitments. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, it was a tough time. Now, I stayed at the university, and I made sure that uh, what happened then never happened again. We did drop sports after that, but there was, it was out in the open, there was an evaluation, um, I also applied for an AD's job, and I've been talking to at another CSU, and I was one of two finalists, and I didn't get the job, and I know exactly why. And then one of our new alumni association staff members was on that hiring committee, and he confirmed to me six months ago what I had suspected the last 15 years. And that's because when they asked, would I drop football? at San Francisco State, I said, not without a strong reason that was open and everybody had, knew what was going on and everything. Mm. And they hired the other person who dropped football mm. within would, three months of being hired. To mm. what extent would you say it's true that the four sports that were dropped were sacrificed to promote football? They were. I mean, I mean what happened was there wasn't a budget deficit. That's true. 
but we didn't have a great budget, okay? So when they dropped the four sports, they took all the money and put it into two strength and conditioning coaches, which guess who they worked with? <laughs> the football program only. They, I, I was hired. I, I kept my assistant athletic director's position and the other half of my position was to start a student athlete support unit because I'd had great academic teams and great graduation rates. So guess what? Program I started, basic, it was for everybody, but the only people that were told they had to use it and all were the football and the basketball programs. University has come far. It has a great program now. But at that time, the money that athletic director Hoffman said was going to support the entire athletic department was not true. It supported two strength and conditioning coaches because prior to that, they had a football coach that did strength and conditioning and they had no academic support and a terrible academic record in those sport, in that sport mm -hmm. specifically. But our problem was if, if, that, if that had happened now, not only would women's field hockey probably have survived with the latest the way Title IX works, but I think a couple of the other men's sports oh, yeah. would have, because, you know, men's sports have been able to use Title IX to keep from being cut. Because it does go both ways. You know, so if you're not, if you're not equitable for your student athletes, you can file a complaint. Mm -hmm. And as I said, most people now think Title IX is discrimination, mm -hmm. basically sexual harassment kind of thing. But it's it it goes across the board. Uh, I'm a product of Title IX. And when I came through as part of the coach and all, I met one of the first women who graduated from West Point. She was there were four women in the first class at West Point after Title IX. And I worked with her because she was in a sports pro Olympic mm -hmm. sports program. Oh. Thank you for Thank you. all of that context. It really helps to round out the stories from those two short clips. Um, so a round of applause for Carolyn. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, if you're just if you're just joining us, um, I just want to say a couple of things. We're about to move into our next uh, segment, which is about a documentary called A Day of Concern. Um, have a seat. Sounds good time. If you want to grab a snack, uh, we have popcorn and candy and soda because we're watching movies. Um, you can sit in the chairs for now, yes. Um, and if you watch three or more segments today, there are soap bags and stars here. <laughs> For you to take home as a as your as your reward. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you think so. I at uh, at four o'clock today, the campus film collection will go live in our digital collection at digitalcollections.sjsu.edu. It does not contain all of the films that uh, we're showing here today, but it does contain many of them. And we'll be adding, we'll be building, uh, adding to that collection over time. So part of this, part of today is to uh, uh, help people get familiar with what's gonna be in that collection. Uh, so the next segment, I guess I should stand where the camera is. The next segment um, is about a documentary called The Day of Concern, which was, produced uh, in the 1960s to inform um, really faculty on faculty and administration about student experiences with dis discrimination on campus. Uh, the first film I'm gonna show you is commentary about some of the controversy around the film. And then the second film is the actual documentary. Uh, just so you all know, the original documentary was um, in, intended to be a series of interviews with black students about their experiences. When that film was going to be shown, there were protests from Mexican American student organizations um, who were angry that uh, their perspectives weren't being represented in the film. 
And so after, if you look, go back in the Spartan Daily, there's a series of articles about this, but after, um, after those protests, the film ended up being recut to feature two films uh, with black students and two films, sorry, two interviews with black students and two interviews with Chicano students. So that's the version of the film that we're showing here today. I hope, I'm hoping the original version surfaces so we have that too, but this is where we are. So here we go. What month in 66 did this come out? As you can see by the fact we're not in Morris Daly Auditorium this morning, a report on the controversial college program, The Day of Concern, has been canceled. Good morning. I'm Jim Braden, news director of the Radio Television News Center at San Jose State College. This was to have been The Day of Concern. Our report on that program was to have been this afternoon in Morris Daly Auditorium. As it works out, the film showing was canceled, at least the Spartan Daily says so, but in truth, this is a day of concern. President Robert Clark, president of San Jose State College, met with the Mexican-American community and students Wednesday night. Since that meeting, Dr. Clark has canceled the film, the second cancellation of the year at the college. The Mexican-American Confederation alleged that in this program, more time was devoted to Negro problems than to Mexican-American problems, even though there is a greater percentage of Mexican-Americans in San Jose's community. You know, it's not easy to be the administrator of a college, especially when there are 23,000 students. And believe me, that's the size of San Jose State College, and it's not easy for Dr. Clark. This year has been the roughest anyone can remember. We have anti-war demonstrations, anti-draft demonstrations, racial crises after another, and goes on every day, even up to the point of where instructors have threatened to strike. The college faced a racial crisis, which the president had to personally take control of to make sure it would be run fairly. At one point, had to cancel a football game, the first time anyone can remember that being done in the history of intercollegiate sports. Then we come to anti-war protesters. The Marines were on campus, the war demonstrators are on campus, and naturally there's a commotion. Students were arrested, um, verbal battles were fought back and forth, and now it's still in the courts. No one outside a politician should have to explain the rational decisions that Dr. Clark has made this year, yet he's held responsible for everyone, and at times held up to ridicule from people from 200 to 1,000 miles away who have no regard or connection with this campus except the fact they know the name and they know who the president is. The topper, of course, is this week, with Navy recruiters and more demonstrations going on, and the Mexican-American question and the cancellation of the film again. Whether the gripes are true or just emotional outcries has no bearing on the matter now. The truth is the faculty presented program was canceled, a full five-hour program down the drain. Everyone on this campus has a right to be tired. We're not calling for a quarter from outside criticism by any means. If everyone wants to jump on the back of the San Jose State College president, let him go ahead. If this policy keeps up, there may be nothing to jump on within a few weeks. First, if you find maybe a grain of good in the college community or what President Clark has done, if you do, let him know. All that we can say is carry on, Dr. Clark. Your educators and students are behind you. Daily, we look to the president for support. He gives it to us. Now he needs some support from us if we can let him know what to do. If we don't, a fine man is going to leave San Jose State. He's going to leave the community itself, greater San Jose, Santa Clara Valley, the whole Bay Area. Then who will lose? I think we will. You're making President Clark responsible, we all are, in one way or another, for all the troubles in the world today, the demonstrators, the racial problem. He's the educator, the top man in this school. He isn't responsible for every problem we have in the world. 
The president hasn't had a day's rest since the beginning of the semester. And I might suggest one thing, if we're going to have any more demonstrations, maybe we could have one giant finale to beat them all and support President Robert D. Clark at San Jose State College. By the way, this is a homecoming button. Homecoming is tomorrow. Uh, happy homecoming. I'm Jim Braden. Good morning. I am Bruce Ogilvy. I would like to share with you today an experience of taping interviews with minority students here at San Jose State College. If you can observe and feel the expressed experiences of these young people and still obscure or deny or repress the awareness that racial prejudice discrimination functions here covertly and overtly, I would say then that you have lost sensitive communication with the hearts of other people. Mr. Noel, I would like to have you share with our faculty the experiences that you've known as a black student within our college community. I, I would like to have them experience, as best you can express it, what it's like to be a, a black man, minority student, within this particular college. Well, I, I think that one of the uh, first things that we should understand is that uh, the nature of the situation here is uh, in many ways different than uh, that in, say, Mississippi. Uh, things here are just not that visible. Uh, there are many things that uh, we discern merely by feelings. Uh, you have to understand this. Uh, particularly uh, in my own case, uh, due to my own personality and uh, maturity, uh, I have not run into uh, many of the difficulties that uh, some of my brothers and sisters have. Uh, I came here, I was 24 years old, had been in the service, uh, etc. I knew how to get around things, I knew how to uh, bowl over uh, obstacles and things of this nature. Uh, so therefore I didn't run into uh, some of the things that the younger kids did. I have uh, had, you know, enough experiences uh, so that uh, I am, you know, fully aware of uh, what goes on. Uh, particularly in the housing sphere, uh, I, w I became conditioned, uh, early in 1960, I became conditioned uh, to stop looking for housing uh, on my own. I got white friends to find housing for me. Uh, I've had experiences uh, where rooming with whites, uh, I had to sneak in at night and things of this nature uh, in, in order to stay there uh, so that we wouldn't be, be evicted. Uh, particularly this year in reference to the things that uh, went, on, went down on campus here, uh, it, it was uh, merely seeing the same things happening to the younger people that got to me. Uh, I saw that they couldn't escape the uh, the more or less subtle uh, racism. What, what, what form uh, that does this racism take as you've experienced it or observed it in your brothers and sisters? Well, I, I, I think that, first of all, uh, in the housing situation, I, I, I know that people have had the same experience that I have. They, they've been unable to get adequate housing. We have a fellow here who 
had to stay in the motel. One of the football players had to, had to stay in the, in the motel because he couldn't find housing. And uh, the people gave uh, very adequate uh, explanations for not giving uh, housing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we understand that uh, the racial thing was still underneath of it. Uh, as far as the uh, campus in general, uh, the fraternity thing has, has always been a, a, a thorn in our side. Uh, uh, seeing uh, totally uh, segregated uh, fraternities operating within this system uh, is there's a, a conflict there because we know what the system is supposed to stand for but yet and still in reality it doesn't now it's extremely difficult for the average faculty or student to understand why you would focus on, on fraternity sorority on greek organization can can you tell them what the, what this means in a feeling sense to you as a black man well to me the fraternities are more or less the symbol of racism in the entire society this is the symbol this is this is like a flag that is waving over on 11th street uh pointing up the uh inhumanness of black people and uh we we just felt that the college uh or the system just shouldn't permit this this type of thing to exist so this is kind of the mirror image of, of, of yes, the... Yes, it's, it's merely the, the image. It's, it's the epitome of, of racism. Yes. Uh, we understand that uh, a lot of influential people go through the fraternity system. Uh, like a fellow said, uh, men, most of the senators, most of, of your... Every president has been a fraternity man. Well, what does this mean to us? You know, what does this, this prove something to us? If, if all these people are fraternity men, well, we're practically, practically lost if this is how the fraternity system is. So in, in, in a sense, you are really being denied uh, any future opportunity or possibly could be denied future opportunity because you're shut out. Right, to, 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 to function as human beings in the society, in the total society. What, uh, if any, uh, do you, have you had any experience of, of uh, bigotry or prejudice from faculty people themselves? Or do you have brothers or sisters that sense discrimination, either covertly or, or, or overtly? Uh, maybe it's uh, kind of a, well, in, in, in any way, do they, do they sense being treated as different? I, I don't think so. Uh, in reference to the academic faculty, I don't, I don't believe there is. Uh, uh, on a personal judgment of my own, uh, I would have to say that I am suspicious of some individuals in the PE department. Uh, in all justice, I have to say that. Uh, I have not witnessed the this, this same sort of thing in the uh, academic faculty. Were you, uh, as uh, convinced as uh, Harry Edwards was about the threat that was imposed two or three weeks back, that the, there was a potential for, for, for violence, would, would you agree that there was a real, a very real threat? In I, I would elevate it from a threat to a promise. A promise. Yes, to a promise. I, th I think that uh, the, the individuals concerned, uh, the black people in this area, uh, totally committed themselves to our cause. And uh, I think that the possibility of violence was very real. Very real. I... How, how can you communicate to this faculty the despair that you people felt right at that moment? How, how could you? How could you communicate it to them so they would sense it, feel it? Uh, on a personal basis, uh, I felt no despair at the moment. Uh, 
I knew what should be done on a personal level. I knew what could be done. And I also knew what I would do if nothing was done. Uh, I am not in the position of Edwards as in relation to trying to control things. Uh, I was not out to control anything on a, on a personal level. Uh, to be quite frank with you, uh, I, I would have had no qualms about joining in myself, none whatsoever. This is, this, this, I say this merely to indicate the, the uh, level of tolerance that I have reached uh, I have risen to a, almost a point of intolerance of, of any type of affront to me. Is there a, is there a white face in this whole community that you trust? This whole college community? Is there a white face that you would have implicit trust in? Say, I have faith. Is there anyone? I have faith in President Clark. And maybe two or three others. But mostly in President Clark. Because he showed himself to me to be a man of unquestionable integrity. One more question. Do you see any signs? Is there any evidence that has diminish your sense of despair or futility in the last two weeks, other than the support you received from Dr. Clark? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. My attitude at this time is the same as it was in September. Is, is there anything that, that you would like to say, that, anything at all, that would be valuable for this audience of faculty? Mm, not in the form of advice or anything of that nature. I am waiting to see exactly what is going to happen. I don't know how long I'm going to wait, but I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see. Thank you very much. That's very good. Well, I, I, I felt that that's, it is inhuman that these percentages should exist in the first place, you know, because if one man dies, that's bad enough as far as I'm concerned. But 20% of the 5 million Mexican American uh, people in the Southwest, Southwestern states, uh, <coughs> this is uh, utterly inhuman as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Al, now I would like for you, in your, in your own words, to share with our faculty some of your feelings as a Mexican-American student here at, at San Jose State? <clears throat> well, primarily the feeling that I have, uh, personally, I'm a Mexican-American and I've been a Mexican-American for the past 24 years. Therefore, I feel that I have some background in a Mex being Mexican-American. Uh, <clears throat> the feeling that I have here, I believe we're concerned with discrimination. I would like to say that uh, to those who, of you who aren't aware of the discrimination that exists here on, in San Jose State, uh, I get the feeling, and I got the feeling when I first came on campus, uh, that there is discrimination, and uh, especially out on 7th Street, whenever uh, there are rallies, rallies, uh, for example, uh, a lot of people talk about uh, discrimination and minority groups being discriminated against lack of housing and so forth. Uh, last week, when uh, the professors against the war were talking uh, and holding classes on Vietnam, uh, some of the young Republicans especially came out and they were stating, uh, making statements about the Mexican-American, about the Negro, and especially minority groups, that the reason they were in a minority uh, situation, they were in a deprived state, was because of their 
lack of interest in higher education, in higher uh, monetary economy goals. I feel that this is untrue, and I feel that uh, community, the, the college, has not been interested in minority groups. Uh, therefore, this, <clears throat> these statements by these uh, students, young Republicans, have been made. Uh, I think it's a lack of education on their part. It's a lack of uh, knowledge. Uh, it, it is very. <clears throat> I can I can see the the reasons why Mexican Americans are in a position such as we are now, uh, having a minority of something like five million in the southwestern states, uh, being the largest minority, and yet not having equal representation on campuses such as San Jose State. Uh, Twenty percent of the San Jose City community is uh, made up of Mexican-American people, and yet only two percent of the 23,000 students here on campus are Mexican-American. How, how do you feel when you keep being blamed for being an apathetic uh, people with, with no desire to, to change your status, that you, you're a happy-go-lucky uh, with guitar-playing culture, and that's all you wish? Uh, personally, it really doesn't bother, that, bother me that much because uh, I know it isn't true, and I know that uh, our apathetic attitude, uh, so-called apathetic attitude, or the impression that Mexican-Americans are uh, peaceful and good-natured people, which we are, but nevertheless, I'm sure you got the impression by the other two students that we are not that way. At least all of us are not that way. <coughs> uh, well, you, you, you're accused of, of not being activists, that you, you, you uh, won't stand up and be counted on the, on the possible denial of your rights as an American citizen. How do you feel about that? I, I'm personally against uh, violence, but uh, sometimes it is necessary to uh, be militaristic and use some of the militaristic tactics in order to be heard. Uh, it seems uh, ridiculous to me that a society must be wrapped over the head uh, in order for the minorities to be heard, in order for the minorities to get what they want for a people that has been here for so many years that uh, they should have to fight for what they want or what is theirs. Uh, I think this is unjust and something should be done about it. Um, Berkeley has a very good program as far as getting uh, more minority students into campuses, into the higher education. The uh, <coughs> college commitment program, which is out of Berkeley and is involved with uh, San Francisco State, and it, it is now uh, taking effect here at San Jose State. I think programs such as this should be considered in uh, greater detail. Uh, more, of this, more of these programs should be uh, taken into effect. Uh, for example, our student initiative pre-college program, which has existed for the past two years, uh, is very basically the same as the college commitment program out of Berkeley, and yet we have been uh, working with pre-college students, high school students, uh, non so-called non-achievers, and uh, we have managed to get a lot of them in interested in college and uh, we have done this on our own without any support from the uh, faculty or administration, and yet we have succeeded because uh, I believe one of the reasons is we have succeeded is uh, because we are interested and we want to help our people, and we, I feel personally that I am obligated as a Mexican-American to help our people, and having the opportunity to be here on a, on a campus, a four-year campus. Uh, in, in a way, uh uh, you, you're challenging us to at least complement what you're doing or to become actively involved in, in, in supporting your, your program then. Right. In the past, we have, uh, other than work-study uh, funds, we have not been supported by the faculty on this. Uh, we had one advisor who mainly did most of the uh, advising and had uh, gave us a little support, but uh, his job here on campus didn't allow him to give us too much support, although we did manage to 
carry our, our pre-college program very successfully this year. But what, what would we have to do as a faculty to show you that we're genuinely concerned and we've heard you? What would you, what would you like to have us do? As, fa uh, as faculty members, I would suggest that uh, you be more interested, not only in the Mexican-American problem, but in other minorities, uh, the Negro, for example, and uh, be well informed on the minority groups, particularly the ones that exist here in San Jose, particularly the Mexican-American, Filipino, and Negro, which are the ones that uh, stand out more, which are the ones that need the most help right now. Mexican-Americans have been neglected uh, for so many years, and I feel, and I would like to ask that if there are any faculty members interested or non-interested to change their attitude toward the minority and find out more about it, find out on their own if, uh, if they wish, but find out more about the Mexican-American and the Negro. Therefore, they could uh, stimulate their interest in that direction. Dan, I'm sure you're aware of the altercation we had here on campus approximately three weeks ago and the threat posed by the black minority students on campus. I wonder if you would share your own feelings and your own experiences with regard to the same problem of, of, of the Mexican-American student within the college community. I see. Very good. Well, primarily, I'd like to go on the premise that you cannot separate the community from the campus. I think that uh, my first point is that the type of discrimination experienced by the Mexican-American on this campus is a form of complete neglect on the part of the administration, on the part of the uh, programs on campus, on the part of the student body as, a, as an entity. I think that there have been various occasions shown that even though the Mexican-American consists of up to 20 percent of the population in this city that they have many times been granted mere token consideration in a lot of the programs, in a lot of the uh, newspaper coverages, in a lot of the uh, community programs that, that include the campus. My, my main concern with the campus and the community, I think that the social science department is the very root of many, many of the Mexican-American problems in our community. I think that the social science department is guilty of sending out teachers, policemen, welfare workers, social workers that are going out into the community inadequately educated because of the social science department. The social science department has very, very little material covering the Mexican-American problems, covering the Mexican-American culture, covering the Mexican-American history. So when you send a policeman out there, he is in effect uh, completely ignorant of Mexican-American and his problem. He is arresting uh, Mexican-Americans without understanding why and how. The teacher is out there condemning the Mexican-American, saying that he is empathetic, when all along the problem is that the teacher is inadequately educated to reach the student, to even communicate with him. So, as a final result, the Mexican-American has the highest dropout rate in the city. The same goes for the counselors, the high school counselors and the junior high school counselors. They automatically, many times, exclude the Mexican-American from college preparatory courses. They feel, and they are in effect told in this campus, and I have significant uh, backing on this from San Jose State College graduates and San Jose State College students, that they are told in effect in many of the classes that Mexican-Americans are apathetic, that Mexican-Americans are fatalistic, that Mexican-Americans just don't care and could and don't appreciate education. We feel that the main problem, and I feel as a Mexican-American, that the main problem is that the professors, that the administration, that the curriculum board, and this college, and the social science department is itself fatalistic, apathetic, and completely discriminatory towards the Mexican-American problems in the community. By neglecting the Mexican-American problems in their courses, they are in effect causing the problems in the community. Uh, Dan, what what are what are some of the the, the goals that you'd like to see uh, realized by our particular faculty here? Say we we, we we become responsible. What 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 are some of the 
the, the things that would uh, make you feel some hope that we cared? Some hope. Primarily, I would feel that the curriculum boards of the, each department and the college should demand that there should be adequate material given in each sociology course, et cetera, et cetera, to each of these social science majors or people in the social sciences that are going out to work with the community. Teach them the history of the Mexican-American. Teach them the culture so that they can appreciate these people are, in fact, as good, if not better, than, the, than the, the society as a whole. Right now, they have an image of inferiority. The society looks at them as inferior. This is, this is, is a terrible crime against the Mexican-American people by the social sciences and the colleges. They should demand, outright demand, on the college library that they provide more material on the Mexican-American problems and Mexican-American history. I believe that the, this... Uh, library is one of the most inadequate libraries in the state when it comes to Mexican-American literature. Uh, this would be two steps. Again, I believe that some of these programs that the, the, that the college uh, provides scholarships and, and financial help should be given uh, priority to the Mexican-American because there is where the problem exists in its largest scope and has the most educational problems. They can't get into college for various reasons, and it's not because they're inferior, because they're pathetic, because they're dumb. It's because they lack the opportunity. I think that the faculty should, should see to it that a lot of these opportunities are not necessarily just left there for the Mexican-American, but actually go out into the community, search for the potential college students, potential college graduates, and bring them in, give them these opportunities. Right now, we have almost 2% of the San Jose State College Mexican-American, yet like I said before, 20% of the community is Mexican-American. This is completely unproportionate, and it's, it's completely unfair to the Mexican-Americans. Thank you very much, Dan. I think you've expressed it very, very well. Valerie, I would like, if you could, to share with our faculty some of the experiences that you've known uh, as a woman and uh, as a black woman in, in our college community. I particularly would like to have you inform them about the ways you have been hurt, the ways you have felt discrimination. And uh, also, I would, if you would, reflect upon your feelings as a minority person returning to the United States after experiencing life in, in a different way. So if you could begin first, if you could give kind of a woman's point of view of what it's like to be a student here at San Jose State. Well, I'm very happy to be able to speak at this time because I think that it is expected of me as a black student to express my views and experiences and also it is needed because many people are misinformed, many people are ignorant to the fact of what is going on on campus, and I appreciate very much the opportunity of being allowed to express my views. As a Negro woman on campus uh, regarding the racial situation of past weeks, I feel very proud that I have been a part of it, mainly because I believe in what has been happening. I know what has been going on. I have been uh, a victim to many of the discriminatory actions on our campus. I think that the black community as a whole, especially the women, have a certain role to play in this. Uh, the black man from San Jose State has taken a stand. And as always, it is the woman's position in every society to stand beside the man. Uh, the black man has convinced us that what we are doing is right. So therefore, my stand is right alongside of all of the other Negro women on campus. And that is of being proud of the fact that we are a Negro student here proud of the fact that we have people who are concerned and know what they're doing. As far as my own experience is concerned, uh, it was a worthwhile thing because I gained a lot of valuable knowledge and uh, even though it hurt at the time and it can't be erased, I am grateful that I was able to go through this because you see, I am different than another Negro. Uh, every person in the world is different, but I mean in a, even a more uh, specified sense. The majority of the Negro students here on campus have been exposed to Negroes before in great number and for a great length of time. I have not. I am from a military family living out of the country the majority of my life. So therefore, I have been 
uh, totally dependent on my family. I've been placed in strange places and strange communities, and so these are the only black people, people just like me that I've known. Uh, the first time that I was ever surrounded by any number of Negro people my age for the same purpose of getting an education in an institution of higher learning was when I came to San Jose State College in the fall of last year. Prior to that time, I had been the only Negro student in my high school and the only one in my college. So you can see right there, I am somewhat limited and restricted. Uh, so therefore, when I came to San Jose State, I was a black woman, but I was more or less whitewashed as far as my cultural patterns and traits because the white community was my main means of identification. I did come here misinformed and completely unaware of the situation that I was about to enter. I'm speaking specifically of the sorority uh, uh, experience that I, I went through. I think this is what we're most concerned with. Um, I went to Rush for the sole purpose of meeting people. I was going to be one new student on a campus of 20,000 plus. And I must admit that I was quite apprehensive because my other college had only been a thousand students. This was a great number for me to jump to. I went through Rush, I met the girls. They were friendly and warm. I achieved what I started out to do, meet people, so that I could identify with people. I, I'm not the type of person who can roam around alone, so I seek people. This is training from being a military brat. You know, you can't wait for people to come to you. You go to them. The sorority system met me with friendship, which I still have, warmth and understanding, which the girls still show towards me. However, I was, I was forced to go through an experience that will always remain with me. It's just like an analogy that I drew when, when I spoke, uh, when the UBSA students and uh, faculty and interested parties came. A statement that I used, and I think this best expresses my views. I look at myself like a fine piece of furniture. I think that I have those qualities that can be termed fine because they have, have been refined by my parents, because I have an education, because I consider myself an intelligent person capable of expressing my thoughts. Uh, so I say a fine piece of furniture that has been scratched. And even though the scratch can be sanded, polished over, and re-sanded, the scratch will always be there. And though it will be covered, and though there might be a smile on my face, and a happiness that I, I think most of the time I live in a world of happiness, um, this rude awakening in the form of the scratch is still there. When I went through Rush, I went to all of the houses on campus. I believe there are 12 sorority houses, 12 or 13. I was invited back by all but one after the first open house. This sorority house, I feel, should be removed from campus completely. They should not have any type of affiliation. If it could not be proven, or people would not accept the fact that they were uh, discriminatory, it should definitely be removed from the Panhellenic Council because of this. Panhellenic says that it is, it is the duty of every house that is rushing to continue to encourage rushies during rush. This is one of the cardinal principles. And this sorority house could have stopped me cold. I would have had no more dealings with the Greek system. I would have had no warm memories from it at all. And I'd like to tell you about this because this was completely ignorant on, on the part of the members of this house. I just can't understand how this could have happened. Um, I walked into the house and it was quite evident that they were aghast that I was coming in. I don't know whether, I mean, Valerie Dickerson doesn't suggest white, black, or red. So this is obvious that they did not know that I was Negro. I walked in and was greeted with hello as the other Rushies. I sat down. Two or three of the members of that house were there. And it was a very cold silence. Now, I can say this because it was not only me that felt this. The girls that were rushing with me when we went out said, Valerie, what was wrong? You know, what was wrong there? So it was sensed. So this is the proof that it was not just me feeling this. Um, such questions as, my, that's a nice dress you have on. Even your shoes match. Or, where did, where did you get this? Uh, things of this nature that was suggesting 
that I either didn't know how to attire myself properly, that I did not have the means or resources of getting these things. These are followed with a series of questions very similar to the point that I just remained completely aloof about it and didn't let it bother me at all. Now, this is just one experience in this house. That's why I feel very strongly that this house should definitely be outlawed. It is a very biased and prejudiced and, and very hateful situation that is existing here. The other houses met me warmly. I was invited back. I carried two houses until the final party, which is the preference party. Now, had I received a bid from either of these houses for the preference party, it would have meant that I would have been a pledge. So this is the reason I'm sure that, that they could not take me to the last party. They were very warm. I can't stress this enough. And they are still my friends. However, the people from these houses, in telling me why I did not receive a bid, were very upset, came to me and talked to me, explained that they were sorry, but you know, you understand. The fraternity men here on campus were the first to tell me, Val, everyone really liked you, but you're Negro, and their nationals would not allow it. At the meeting that I first mentioned, uh, one of the Panhellenic members said, no, it was not their nationals. They called the nationals, and the nationals said, fine, but it was bias within the house. And the thing that I cannot understand is that if these girls invite me back as their friend, without any intentions of, of pledging me, that I can go there and feel comfortable within that house on just a normal basis, then you can't tell me that the people that dinged me, the expression that is used, were dinging me because they did not, not like me as a person. It was admitted that these people could not pledge me because I was Negro, that I would not fit into the social pattern. Okay, Valley, how, many, how many people, how many girls, prove their genuine affection for you by leaving the house, or...? To my knowledge, I know of none. But, again, I say to my knowledge because it could very well be that someone did, and I just have not known about it. But to my knowledge, there are no girls that have left the house. Does, does this disappoint you or make you feel...? It disappoints me to, to this extent, that if I care enough for a person, if I believe so deeply in an organization that I belong to, if I cannot be proud of the way they handle the situation, proud of the fact that they take all people who qualify, then I don't want to be a part of it, you see. But this is me because I am a different person, as I said. Um, these girls have still proved their loyalty. That's a big thing for them to give up for one person, such as I. Had they done it, it would have spoke even more so, of, of the integrity of the sorority. Now, to my understanding, and I do stand corrected if any of this is erroneous information that I have received, on this particular point, the fact that if a sorority would pledge a Negro against their national's wishes or any other minority group, that they would simply lose their national charter and affiliation for a year, however this would be reinstated. Now, to me, if a sorority could have done that, then this would have been something that I would have been proud to belong to. But you see, what they fail to understand, I could have undergone a severe emotional, uh, a psychological tailspin, if you want to term it as such, because, you see, they, they didn't realize that I was white-oriented. I was very much, much so. And um, I, in being turned away from the sorority, I could have felt like I was being rejected by the culture that I know the best. But I must say this, and I'm very proud to say this, that it had it not been for the black students on this campus, their warmth, their understanding, the fact that they knew that I was a little bit different, I didn't have the soulful quality that a Negro has, uh, I was not so deeply a part of their culture, had it not been for their understanding and compassion and ex in accepting me for what I am, then I would have been wandering and very lost because this hurt very deeply, but they, they realized this. Valerie. Is your father, as a colonel in the United States Air Force, serving his country, has he been made aware of what you experienced? Has he expressed? Uh, oh, yes, he has. My father retired last August, and he is a marvelous and very amazing man. And I know that just sounds very typical of any girl speaking of her father, but he really is. And, and so is my mother and my only brother. He's 11 years old. They're all aware of this. I'm not the type of person that can keep these things inside of me. I've got to 
talk about them, and I turn to those people who know me best, and that's my family. Um, I called my parents almost daily when the crisis began. I told them what was going on, what I was doing, what part I was taking, because, you see, I didn't want them to get this in a newspaper, that the black students on San Jose State are rioting and so forth and so on. They know me well enough to know that I would never get behind a cause that was not justified. And I, I called them and explained to them, and they were very much for it. They said it's something that needed to be done. And you see, my, they are very proud of the fact that I took part. Because my father uh, was a young, young man when he went into the service and was in the heart of the South and was a victim of many forms of degradation, of degrading factors that I could never begin to explain. So he knows the frustration of the young student of today. Probably one more question. Were you as despairing as the students were a few weeks back? Were you, uh, did you feel that you were right at the end and, and the, the threatened violence to you was understandable? Oh, it was definitely understandable. I have to insert this. This summer, I worked uh, for my congressman in Washington, was appointed to a poverty program in the heart of Bedford Stuyvesant. I am strictly a Negro, middle-class person, and I lived there in the ghetto. I understood and felt and, and knew what the people of the ghetto were experiencing. When I came back to San Jose and this was all taking place, it was timely for me. I could identify, I knew what was going on, I felt this. And the only thing, I think the best way I could sum this up is um, a, a, a little quotation that our project had that was very beautiful and that I believe in. And it has to be taken literally, not in the sense of every word meaning something different. But I can say that I looked for my friend and he forsook me. I looked for my God their God, and he forsook me also. But I looked for my black brother, and I found both. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. Thank you. I'd like to invite our panelists to discuss the film uh, up to the table. Uh, so we have Jamal Williams, who is the director of EI Partnerships here on campus. Uh, Dr. Carrie J. Malloy, who is the director of the Ethnic Studies Collaborative. Dr. Ken Knoll, Dr. Ken Knoll, who will be here in a moment, who uh, um, you know, among the many things that he has done, including appearing as the first student interviewed in this film, uh, is also an alumni of San Jose State, a former professor here, and the one of the co-founders of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, and Dr. Monica Allen, who is, among many things that she does, the co-chair of the Campus Committee on Diversity, Equity. I'm limiting bios in order to provide more time for discussion. There's a lot more to say about everyone up here. Um, so thank you all for being here. I wanted to start um, just by asking about your initial reaction, seeing those films. I'm going to ask, I think we'll start with Jamal, go to Carrie, and then Monica, and then Ken will come to you last you have the most context. Is that all right? <laughs> all right, Jamal, your initial reaction from watching that film. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate you having me on the panel, and I like to call this the three doctors plus Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, so I was intrigued. Um, just there's so many similarities. Um, I think it also there were some differences in terms of where we are now. Mm -hmm. You could tell this was a long time. It was it was a while ago, given that like it was, the campus was only two percent. Um, uh, they say Mexican American. We say Latinx now, right? Um, and then the city was only 20%. And we know now the city is closer to 30, um, 30 plus percent. Latinx. It's, it's around like 30.9%. So the demographics have shifted. I, I didn't, I don't know what the, the, the numbers of black students were um, at that, at that juncture. Uh, I thought the, what really intrigued me the most was the, the report from the cynical commentator. Um, <laughs> 
but he what he talked about was this um, pull of who's getting attention and who's getting things addressed, uh, whose issues are at the forefront. And I think we're actually at a space like that now. Um, I think there's a lot of parallels where we're hearing from 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 uh, racially. I'll, I'll say in a in a racial ethnic context, we're hearing from black students, faculty, and staff. We're hearing from uh, Latinx students, faculty, and staff. We're hearing from Jewish faculty, staff, and students. We're hearing from um, uh, Swana, Muslim, uh, Palestinian faculty, staff, and students. Right. We're hearing from Native, and we're and there's there's all these populations that have all these needs. And it, it 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 really does parallel the, the conversation that I saw, and it just gets me thinking about like what would what would solidarity like true solidarity like transformational um, solidarity towards fighting for like a, a a you know justice for all liberation for all what would that have looked like then, and how would that have shifted the campus, and then what what would it look like now? Right. Instead of thinking about this as like it's my moment, or it needs to be mine, or it like it, like how can we think about shared uh, oppression of, of one is shared, and the fight with one needs to be shared. So that's kind of what's been flowing through my brain since I watched. Thank you, Jamal. Gary. Sort of, it's sort of similar. Is that starting with the commentary and then the film is. The conversation is still going on. The same conversation that was going on at that time is still happening today, but what was striking was who wasn't in these films. There were more than just African-American and Mexican-American Latinx students here. So there's a whole other group, the other groups left out. And, I, and not to diminish what is what's in the film is that it puts us in the place of the competition for resources and that the language that we use, minority underrepresented students, all of this isn't about an inclusiveness. It's to acknowledge that there's always been an exclusiveness to education. And that coming into it, now what we're still doing as was happening is competing for resources and competing for attention. And it's becoming, and get the narrative builds on this oppression Olympics who has suffered the most and who therefore should get the acknowledgement. And listening to the student talk about the social science curriculum, we have a mandate now in California within the CSU that every student has to take an ethnic studies course. That is sort of answers that call that this be taught. However, when you put students who are now coming into the university who don't have a background, don't have an understanding of why this mandate is there, they're mad. Why do I have to take an African American studies history course? Why do I have to take a native studies? Why do I have to take an Asian? That's not what I came here to do. So this conversation is still going on, but at the same time, we don't ever stop uh, really long enough to look back and say, where did this all come from? And how do we get here and explain it? We seem to just keep moving through the same circle over and over again instead of sitting down and saying, how do we make this all work for each and every one of us and support each other to get to the next step? Because what native students have been calling for on this campus isn't the same as what everybody else has been calling for. But how do we so use those two calls to support each other to get to where we need to be? So that, that's been what's going through my head. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Monica. In addition to what's already been said, a, a couple of things stuck out. One is that, um, this was happening on the heels of protests. We have a long history of that here and we are, there was protests on campus just yesterday and we're still responding in the same way, right? We wait for a protest and then we do something instead of getting out ahead of what, you know, might be a potential problem. Um, the other thing, like, so we call it whataboutism now, but like those are the same things happening. The other thing that struck me um, was this, utter and complete faith in the administration of this institution, right? So, so the first person was, I was like, okay, well, you would expect them to be, you know, like pro the president or whatever. But then the statement that I trust Dr. Clark, you know, and very few others. And I leaned over to Jamal and I said, no one would say that about any of our presidents. 
but but and and it strikes me that in that in all this time we have like devolved in our faith in our administration to actually do something to help solve the problem the problems haven't changed but we have lost faith in the ability of our leaders to help fix them thank you thank you okay okay so i was there right (laughs) (laughs) and we're glad you're here (laughs) and and i would not say that about any other president since clark i wouldn't i wouldn't do that um the Having been there and done the the interview with Ogilvy, um, I was, of course, interested in um, what kind of job did I do? Uh, you know, how informative was that was that interview? Uh, and I was concerned about that. But after I watched the thing five, six, seven times, I decided that that was not significant. That was not the t- significant thing for me today. Uh, <clears throat> I think more sig- significant for me today was uh, what I saw in terms of the differences in our situations and our view and interpretation of that's those situations and how that influenced what we did. Um, I think the main thing is that um, the, the Blacks, we were concerned about ourselves as students on the campus. A lot of the other conversation was about the communities and the discrimination that goes on in the community. But we were we were concerned about the actual impact of discrimination directly on our being. And that drove our actions. Okay. Now uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> I mean, I feel like I want to give you all the time you want, but yeah, we have about 10 minutes. <laughs> well, Ogilvy asked about um, the shutting down of the of the football game. Yes. And the threat of violence. Yes. Okay. And <clears throat> um, the threat of violence is a real thing. The way I answer that, okay, um, I held back. I held back because what he was talking about was something that I was very familiar with because in high school, I burned down the circus that came to our town and and the, the circus workers did some stuff that we didn't approve of. And I wound up burning down the circus myself. Mm-hmm. So I'm not unfam- I wasn't unfamiliar, particularly in back in that day when I was being interviewed. I was I'm not I wasn't unfamiliar, <clears throat> unfamiliar with the use of violence, the significance of the use of violence. Mm-hmm. Along with that, I grew up in a. Uh, segregated town in the north. And I, I considered, considered that form of segregation northern Jim Crow. Mm-hmm. I spent four years in the Air Force in Pensacola, Florida. And, and the, the segregation, the Jim Crow there was virulent. So I was very familiar with with Jim Crow. And when I came to San Jose, I found Western Jim Crow. And if you really look at the force behind Jim Crow, it's violence and the threat of violence that makes it work. So we're de- dealing with it every day. We were dealing with it every day 
And to the extent that it exists today, we are still dealing with managing that violence and that threat of violence. And that's something I don't think that we recognize very much. It's a violent thing. Racism is a violent thing. And, uh, you know, when you have a system that's based on violence, don't be surprised about what happens, what comes out of it. Thank you, Ken. The next thing I was going to ask, though, I think I might leave my next question and see if anyone in the audience has anything they'd like to ask. And if not, I'll, I can proceed with my planned program. Any questions for the panel? I'd like to hear about uh, how, how the... Uh, the safety nets that I'm using the word safety nets because I'm a retiree. What were the safety nets in place for kids, students, et cetera, as they stayed back then? And what exists today in terms of support for the students that are struggling with the racism and the it's, a, it's discontent and it's everywhere. It's not just as they say. What support is there on campus for brown, black, everybody, everybody that's struggling? Mm -hmm. Trying to get to the board years. What is this date to support students? Um, I will say, you know, this is this is a non-company line. I actually do believe this. Um, and also, before that, you got to do something really bad as a circus to get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> they had to be terrible. Circus, they had to be the worst circus ever. So I'm sure you do what you had to do. Um, <laughs> I think now I can't hear what you said. So I, I was saying, good job on burning the circus because they deserved it. <laughs> yeah. I think now uh, we, I think we have more supports in place now for students than we have ever had. And to to Carrie's point, I I still think uh, Monica touched on it too. I still think we're still reactive, right? Um, we. I work in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We have one of those. We didn't have one of those pre-2015. We have a, a staff there. We have multiple cultural centers, but the, the candidate, we're looking for a new um, senior diversity officer. And that person talked about like, how could the campus not recognize that we needed a native student center before the students had to ask for a native student center? Like, how did you not think about that? And so we're still in, in, in a reactive phase, but we have um, we have supports. We have themed housing floors that we're hoping to bolster in housing specifically for communities. Um, uh, we have our uh, our Black Scholars floor and our what's the one for our Pride um, the rainbow 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 floor. Rainbow floor. Um, so we have themed housing. We have student centers. We have uh, academic departments. We have support that, that that's there. We just need more of a plan to connect the struggle and how to deal with deal with issues to connect it together so it doesn't feel reactive or piece by piece. I think that's what we're noticing. Now we need a we need a broader plan, which I think we're moving towards. You know, again, I'm I'm saying this as an option, it's not as somebody who just sounds like state and gets paid. <laughs> One other question. So these are these are things that show uh, that change is taking place, yeah. and change is taking place. Uh, but of course, uh, as we all know, there's a long, long ways to go. Um, <laughs> my opportunity to put in here the the mantra of the Olympic Project for Human Rights is that um, the, the road to the more perfect union, on the road to the more perfect union, there are no final victories. It's a, it's a fight forever. 
Well, I think the one thing is, and I was there during that time in 66 and all, and knew Valerie and, and all. Um, the statement about divided groups, okay? If you can divide people, you can conquer them. And where I see now is groups are starting to see that if I'm oppressed, oppressing somebody else isn't going to help. Because divided, we all are all going to fall. You know, at the same time, the women's movement was moving at that, that same time. And each of those movements were fighting for the limited resources, were fighting for the limited time, the oppression was basically the same. If you really opened it up and looked at it, the oppressor was the same. And we just, we started fighting each other too. And so what I see now and having been a faculty member here for 30 plus years is there's so much more diversity. When I was a student here, the only women I ever saw were in the nursing department and in the women's physical education department and a couple of others there were outliers. Um, it it was again divided. It's easy to conquer. What, what is your title, Mark? Um, I, I'm an associate professor of public health, and I'm the chair of the Department of Public Health and Recreation. I'm going to say this. Yes, yes. yes. First, <laughs> first black woman um, to serve as a chair of a department at San Jose State outside of African American studies. <laughs> Um, so that's how far we haven't come. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm also, as Carly mentioned, the chair, uh, faculty co-chair of the Campus Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is a uh, relatively new group of folks that I think is, to Jamal's point, trying to look at diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging issues more comprehensively um, and, and broadly. Have you found people to be very receptive to, you know, DEI belonging? I'm in the outside of the education world. I've seen like, you know, some people don't want to go to the training. They don't believe in it. They have all of these <laughs> issues. How is that working on the campus amongst you know, faculty and supporters? Yeah. Oh, you've been looking at me. Damn. I only got two minutes. I will talk the whole <laughs> time. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's my turn. Um, well, let's put it this way. I arrived here in 2021. So this is my third year. I had from a campus, much, much, much smaller campus to this. So it's, it's a huge shift for me. But what I find shocking is when I got here is that there was no Native American studies or indigenous studies program on this campus. I'm the very first assistant professor of Native American Indigenous Studies this campus has ever had. So how is DEI working here? It's, it's working, but slowly. And, it, and it's going to depend on where you're at. It depends on where you are at on this campus, how you see that working. In some areas, you see it actively happening on a day-to-day -day basis. People are engaging in it. There are other areas where it's sort of like, uh-huh, I got to go to that training again. Yeah. Thank you. I think the difference is, is that we can't policy our way out of this. You can pass every policy in the world you want on DEI. You can set up everything you want. The only way you get through it is open dialogue and conversation. And that's what you actually have going on. So I think if you look at it from that standpoint, we're making strides. And it, you know, you're not going to fix it overnight. This was hundreds of years in the making. And everyone sort of thinks that we can just flip a switch and it's over with. It, it doesn't happen like that. So I think we're making the step, taking the steps we have to take, and we're working through it as best we can. And, you know, the world does not seem to be slowing down. Mm -hmm. So every day we have a new new thing we have to respond to and trying to at least build on everything we've done in the past. So um, I believe in a multi-level approach to everything. That's what my training in public health has taught me, that you can't legislate away everything, but it's a good start, right? Like if you if you make sure that there is a gender neutral restroom in every building on every floor it's at least a start right because then what you do is you create a culture of inclusiveness like we now have an entire generation of people who will never think that a black man can't be president 
right? Like, so we have to start there. And then we also start from the bottom up. We do have conversations like this and we, like we share, you know, and, and remember these things. I think the main thing that in my work in DEI that I attempt to do is to help everyone understand that these ideas are everyone's ideas, right? And everyone's responsibility. I, I had a, one of the faculty members in my department go to our associate dean about something that she thought was a race issue. And his response was, oh, well, then you go talk to the people at ODEI, right? No. So we have this office now. We have this one person who's in charge and four or five people to help them. How are they going to solve the problems of the 40,000 people that are affiliated with this place, right? This is everyone's responsibility. And if we can do that, I think that's where we get started. And I think people are interested intellectually because they're very excited about the idea of having a diversity officer and a diversity officer office less excited about the idea that this might come home to roost with you all <laughs> so how are the fraternities and sororities going oh i don't know jamal you could talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so which fraternities yeah, are, like, are you asking right, about I, uh, I know and i know we got to wrap up soon the, um, they're all together our 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 National Panhellenic Council, so our, our Black uh, fraternity and sorority organizations are, um, they, 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 they were at a precipice. They were at a, uh, they were growing tremendously pre like 2017, 2018, then took a dive and there's, we're working to get them back um, flourishing. They're here, back flourishing. Uh, the other organizations um, still exist, and some have incidents and need training. Uh, some need more training than others. And I think that is a constant area of work with our student involvement team, with our Office of Diversity. Um, and so th th there's still a lot of work that, that can be done to, to make sure we are growing and engaging the, the organizations that, it, that it exist and have history, but also teaching those uh, organizations that may have a history of oppression, like the ones in the film, history of microaggressions um, and racial bias incidents. We, st we still we still got some work to do there because we're getting people from all over the place that mm -hmm. are learning and people from all over the place that are learning could do stupid stuff and do <laughs> stuff. Thank you all Thanks. for being here. This definitely is a longer conversation, and we're not having that longer conversation today. But yeah, thank you all. Uh, we have just a couple minutes pause before we go into the next segment, which is going to be on ethnic studies. So if you want to take a moment, stretch, get some snacks, share your feedback. Um, <laughs>
So by the fourth time, we got together at the time we said, you put up the rules, but I don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. So it's the History Department of San Jose State College presents History 17A. We're going to do something different today. Uh, I have with me Mr. Feliciano Rivera, who is Assistant Professor of History at San Jose State, and Mr. Gerald Labrie, who is the Interim Chairman of the Black Studies Program at San Jose State. And we're going to talk today about some of the things that have been left out from your 17A ITV program. Uh, these things haven't been left out intentionally, but they have been left out. I think they've been left out because the people who put the program together were white American historians, uh, and they simply weren't yes. sensitive, as they might have been, to some of the problems of minority groups, and particularly the black and the Chicano minorities in America. Uh, this is a result of the kind of training they've had themselves, it's kind of, and it really, it's nothing unusual. It's the sort of thing that almost all American history textbooks do and all American history courses do. And I'd like to ask you gentlemen to begin with, why do you think uh, United States history has fallen into this posture, into this trap? Bill? Well, I, I personally believe that the reason that they fall in this trap because it has been basically the uh, the historian uh, from, uh, shall we say, the Anglo-Saxon historian has been writing the history of the United States. And there has been very few of us of the minority groups involved traditionally in writing the history of the United States. And I also believe that, of course, a historian being one of the most, uh, or looked upon in our society as one of the, uh, the trusted interpreter of uh, what uh, history is, or telling us what we are and who we are, has been much uh, left to in the hands of the Anglo-Saxon historian. And this is why he's perpetuated and, uh, so I say, continued traditionally in the same way that the historians in Europe had since before they came to the United States, that is, the historians of the Anglo-Saxon experience. Okay. Gerald? Well, I feel that uh, it's a matter of uh, perspective. Uh, my ancestors were brought over here as slaves, so therefore, we would have a different perspective of American history than a white man would, who was the masters, the slave masters. So therefore, I think this is really why you find this type of development in American history, because the people that were in power, the white Anglo-Saxons, the white Europeans, were interested in maintaining their power, and the only way they could maintain their power was to make themselves feel superior and make the black man feel inferior. So I think this type of thing have carried over into their history. This is the way of maintaining their power over the oppressed people. The, the history of, of the, black, the black experience in America, Negro history, has been gotten in, at least by the back door. There are more and more of the textbooks, more and more of the readings are dealing with black history. Um, but we haven't yet gotten to the, to the Mexican-American experience, really, in our history books. Why do you think that is? Well, I feel that uh, because the, the black has had the civil rights movement, pushing his cause and 
I believe uh, nationally or total America has this, uh, or the black has uh, the national moral conscience behind him of the, of the country behind him. Whereas the Mexican, some people don't even recognize the Chicano yet or the Mexican American. Some people don't even know he exists east of the Mississippi. And it's been a regional thing. And for many, many years, the, the Mexican American, in fact, has ridden on the civil rights movement or the coattails of the black movement. And I think it hasn't been until relatively the last two or three years, or less than that, that the Chicano or the Mexican American has struck out on his own. And I think maybe, possibly, maybe he has to make a little bit more noise, or maybe he has to burn one or two more buildings than the blacks have in order for the to uh, wake up and recognize his needs. Um, let's move on and, and deal with some of the specific kinds of things that have been left out, that haven't been treated properly, that have been taken from a warped or one-sided perspective. Um, the first question I'd like to throw at you is the question of, of who are America's heroes? Uh, you know, I, I could run down a list of names. It would include Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and Davy Crockett. Um, uh, and one of the things we know about the last two men is that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Uh, and we know that Davy Crockett uh, was defending American honor and when he was killed by overwhelming numbers of Mexicans who seem, for some silly reason, to have been invading Texas. Uh, would you like to talk about who the heroes are from your perspective? Well, I think uh, not only did white historians confront us with white heroes, but uh, when they did give us some black heroes, they were the more passive element of our history, like they gave us uh, Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver, and uh, the more passive of our, our people that stood out in our history. They never really showed how, I think the purpose of this was to show that we were always satisfied and happy with our conditions of slavery. Who would you think should be well, I mean, specific we, people? Or? We've, well, I think to point out individuals, well, we've had uh, Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, Harriet Tubman, people like this that have always been involved in the struggle to liberate us from our oppressed conditions. But I think more important than this is that they have been a constant resistance on the part of black people when they were, they were over here. We were not satisfied. We were not happy with our conditions here. Uh, the next one is pre and, uh, There were many ways that we were in uh, Many times uh, the mother yeah. would kill her child at birth. And uh, uh, the workers, they would slow down. You know, they were going to slow down. They would sabotage uh, uh, their, uh, their workload in some manner. And there are many ways of resistance. And this type of thing is not brought out in uh, traditional uh, American history. And I think these are the things that are important in terms of showing us who our heroes were you know, and what they meant to us in terms of liberating us from our conditions. So what do you think of Remember the Alamo as a great American slogan? Well, first of all, I, I think that it's the um, misinterpretation not only on the part of uh, historians, but uh, what they do to the minds of the public, the general public society, of what the Alamo is. A lot of people don't know that, for example, the people in the Alamo were, in fact, either Mexican citizens or illegal aliens in Mexico at the time that Santa Ana came up and socked it to them. Uh, they, they, they feel, a lot of Americans feel, that the Mexican army, for example, led by General Santa Ana, was intruding on American soil. That that's to what extent history has in fact affected their minds. They believe, they don't know that these people were dissidents and they were Mexican or illegal aliens. The heroes of the Alamo, for example, and Lord in his book of, of the heroes of the Alamo states this very well as to uh, who the people are. Davy Crockett, you know, that in fact he was an alcoholic and in fact he was, like he calls him, a successful failure. And uh, these people that are involved, they, they make heroes just like they do in Texas of, uh, of the Texas Rangers. There's always been a Travis in the Texas Rangers, etc. But they never point out that, in fact, uh, there have uh, the facts, more with the Mexican-American and the black, for example, because I feel that the Mexican-American, in fact, is indigenous to the area. Uh, well, what, so he's in, what heroes would you specifically... Well, I would go back, for example, and, uh, for example, what do they say about uh, the ANSA? Uh, and his, uh, ex and his uh, exploits as, a, as an explorer, as a pathfinder, uh, way 30 years, 40 years before uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition for a while, for, 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 for an example. Um, 
1,600 miles from northern Mexico to San Francisco, Monterrey and San Francisco, with a loss of one life of 240 colonists. Uh, they never talk about this man. This is one of the greatest men back there. Cabeza de Vaca, which in fact was with Esteva and Dorantes, uh, would before them, way back. Esteban was a black? Esteban was a black, of course, and uh, uh, that, that traversed the total southern United States uh, uh, across what is the southwest of the day, back between 1528 and 1535. My goodness, they never mention these people. Um, do they mention Coronado in 1540 and his uh, intrusion into what today all the way north of where today is ne where Nebraska is at, etc. And what his, shall I say, part in the developing of the Southwest. In fact, it's what you see. You can go on and on and on, because up through 1848, as fact, we are talking about the history of the northern uh, uh, Hispanic colonial empire. Uh, well, for, for after 1821, of course, it's Mexico. Okay. And uh, the, the thing that we were conquered people, and we were conquered people, uh, this is the difference between, shall I say, we were here, we were not, shall I say, brought here. We were not brought here like, say, the blacks were brought from Africa, etc. We were here because I believe we are, we are more Indian than, in fact, Hispanic. And uh, I think uh, this is one of the things that we have to consider when we try to, in fact, uh, uh, teach the history of the, of the Chicano or the Mexican-American. Okay. Um I suppose, too, from that perspective, your, your heroes would include some of the Indians who resisted uh, well, Sitting definitely. Bull and, uh, well, definitely. he's a uh, uh, Geronimo. Uh, Geronimo. We looked yeah. at Geronimo. We looked to, uh, to the other Indian heroes, not only here, but in Mexico. See, uh, t when you talk about uh, heroes to the Mexican, uh, the political border on the frontier today uh, uh, does not, uh, shall I say, uh, stop us in looking at our heroes. Our heroes are those people that have always stood up for the rights of the Indian in Mexico or the, under, uh, uh, the disadvantaged. Uh, Emiliano Zapata of the Mexican Revolution. You go further back than this. You, uh, to, you go back to Hidalgo, okay. where the, the movement of independence uh, in Mexico. And uh, where, say, the black, for example, could talk about southern United States. I think when the black talks about his history, too, he has to take in consideration of the blacks in the Caribbean, for example, of the blacks even in Brazil. The total concept Two of the Two and so. Definitely. Uh, I just um, can't see how we yeah, do it. It's an interesting fact, I don't think it's well known, but that the Seminole resistance in Florida to American invasion was led by blacks, was led by escaped slaves who'd entered into the tribe, who'd intermarried with blacks, and they were the ones who resisted till the very end. I'd like to ask Mr. Rivera a question now in terms of uh, the, the Chicano being a captured uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, do they still have a resentment toward uh, the Yankee or... Uh, in uh, in Mexico, for example, up through 1939, and I know of when I was uh, at school in Mexico, uh, to that date, uh, and later on even, uh, in some of the geography books, the textbooks, the, the, the border, as it is right now, was never depicted. The border was still where it was before 1848. There is a deep resentment against the gringo, the gabacho, in, uh, in Mexico, and within the Mexican-American, which is sort of out of an undercurrent. The, the American tourists, the deals in Mexico or deals on the frontier, they think that they love them dearly because of the dollar. Uh, but there is a, a, a resentment. Let uh, me get in. Let me, let me, what I wanted to do next is get into the backgrounds. And um, we have had a lecture on uh, the backgrounds of American civilization, and it was the European backgrounds, and particularly the English background, the Anglo Saxon heritage of America. Now, from a black perspective, uh, what should we have taken in? What should we have portrayed? Well, I think in dealing with uh, our origins before we came here to America, uh, they were always depicted as being uh, an, an uncivilized people coming from Africa, coming to America and being civilized. So uh, we never really got a true sense of our history before we came here to America. But once, once you start doing some research and investigation, you found that blacks did have some uh, great civilizations back in Egypt, which was a black civilization, also on the west coast of Africa, which most of the blacks here in America came from. The west coast of Africa had the Ghana, em Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, many, uh, a, a very glorious past, but this type of thing was kept out of the textbooks and we never knew about them until we uh, got this new awareness and start doing some research on our history before we came over here. Why do you, th um, 
Why has not there been much experience of the, or much historical discussion of the Iberian background, the Spanish Peninsula, as a European background to American civilization? First of all, because those uh, great interpreters of our history, uh, many of them have been incapable of doing research in Spanish uh, in language. They can't go to the primary sources. Uh, very few of them can. And then second of all is because they're hung up with that mentality of Northern Europe that existed in Northern Europe before the American experience as they looked at the Iberian Peninsula and the, uh, the Mediterranean cultures, including the Spaniards. The, whether it was because of envy, because of where they were at at that particular time in the world. But this was perpetuated when they came to the eastern seaboard, the Anglo-Saxons. At the same time, uh, the Indian, which is very much part of our heritage, the Aztec and the, the Mayan civilizations and the Pueblo, even uh, in the southwest, which is all part of the Mexican, is, uh, is slighted because from the very beginning, uh, anthropologists and archaeologists in studying ancient civilizations, the direction has always been to the Fertile Crescent or the Egyptian. Uh, th until today, right to this, this day, they are still doing their digging in, uh, in the Yucatan, on the Yucatan Peninsula and in Mexico City, around Mexico City, and discovering things that, uh, that in fact they never knew about. The, the, the Aztec, the Toltec, and the other civilization before. And we are definitely part of this, the, the Mexican. But this is never shown, and has never been really shown, as it should have been, or taught, or researched. And I think because of the, the same direction, the northern type of uh, mentality, the northern European type of mentality, of just looking at the western world, and the white or the Germanic type of, uh, of uh, people as being superior, and the others, people, it, it comes right down to it of, of being the, the cowboy and Indian type of thing, you know. The Indians are the bad guys and the cowboys are the good guys. It really comes down to those simple terms. Beyond that, the good guy wears the white hat and the bad guy wears That's the black right. hat. Right. Um, Gerald, you touched a little bit before on, on the, when you said that the history of, of the black experience in America was a history of a people, of a people struggle. Now, when we tend to think, again, in the white American terms, we think of a people's struggles, we think of the struggles of the first people to conquer the wilderness, and which involved, of course, driving out the, driving out the Indians who lived there. Uh, and we think of the heroic struggles of the Americans to win independence from England. Uh, looking at it from a black perspective, what struggles would you emphasize? Would you like to go a little further into what you said before? Well, I think one thing we should take into consideration in terms of uh, the slave here in this country, that he, was, uh, he went through uh, an acculturation process where as his original culture was destroyed and he became part and product of the American uh, society, a product of the society. So therefore, many times uh, he took a very passive uh, view, I mean, of, of his uh, conditions. But you, you did find some resistance among uh, some of the blacks during slavery. And, uh, well, more specifically, the abolition movement, which was, uh, I think, mainly controlled by whites, but involved uh, blacks also. And I think looking at the abolition movement in our history, I would compare it uh, to the civil rights movement of uh, the past 10 years. It was... Um, I think a more moderate form, a uh, reform movement, rather than uh, the real uh, resistance that uh, I think should have occurred to actually free us from the shackles of slavery. You know, there's some evidence uh, been mounting now that one of the things that the free soil movement was mainly interested in was making sure that no blacks, slave or free, came into particularly the Northwest Territory. The old frontier that Turner had described as democratic, but in 1859 and 1860, people in Kansas, people in Nebraska, people in Oregon uh, voted overwhelmingly to keep black men out, free or slave. They didn't want any part of slavery, but there's some evidence that their hatred of slavery was as much a hatred of black people in any shape or form as otherwise. Um, let me throw another question at you, Joe. Um, I remember a black anthropologist, Council Taylor, uh, raising the question that when we read our history books, now we're beginning to read about black men who took part in the American Revolution to help the fight for independence. And he said uh, that that shows really how one-sided it was, because 
black men probably could get their own independence better by siding with the British, but we don't hear about those blacks. What do you think of that? I think that's very significant, especially uh, when you see that, uh, well, I think it would relate to the whole third world concept that exists among uh, the oppressed peoples of the world today, whereas uh, uh, we all have a common enemy. And I feel that uh, if we would have really understood our situation back during the Revolutionary War, we perhaps would have sided with uh, the, the British and the French, you know, in terms of trying to free ourselves from our specific uh, oppression. I think it's a very good point. Phil, what about particular struggles of the, the Mexican, Mexican-American? In, uh... Well, first of all, after 1848, up, like I say, up to 1848 in, in the history of the Americas, or here in the United States, the history of the Mexican-American is, is the history of the, of the, first of all, from 1821 to 1848, history of Mexico proper. Before then, it's the history of the colonial, the Hispanic colonial empire, which I consider the Hispanics being European too, to a certain extent. Uh, then, after 1848, you go through a period when the imposition of Anglo-Saxon culture, and uh, politically and economically too, is imposed upon us in the Southwest. And at this time, uh, they pass legislation, and uh, we start struggling to even hold the property that we have. We start struggling to even hold the language that we use, uh, etc. Then, after, it's especially uh, important to realize that after 1882, after the Chinese Exclusion Act, and then the 1907, the Jap- Japanese, uh, the uh, Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan, in excluding the Orientals from this country, uh, the, the struggle of the Mexican people from 1882 on to this day has been a struggle against the agribusiness in this country. Because you could write the history of the Mexican people, I feel, in this country by writing the history of the agribusiness in this country. Because we, f- we filled agri-business, we- the agribusiness, the agricultural uh, base, the, the business. Uh, I say agribusiness because I, this is a short term, uh, which is a multi-million dollar and has been for some time business. Well, the Mexican-American always has look, been looked at as a source of labor for this particular uh, business uh, from the very beginning. We filled the void after the Chinese coolie. And uh, if you check the history of immigration in this country, the laws and the legislation, which began about 1882, you will find that, in fact, there's always been a clause or there's always been some part there that is different from the rest as it relates to, to Mexico. And this is, this, uh, if we can bring this all the way up to 1964, when they uh, eliminated the, the Procedo program from Mexico. The biggest lobbyists in Washington were, in fact, the growers' associations, one of the biggest here in California, fighting against this. Why? I mean, I, I'm sure that we have people in here who can do this thing, but that's the reason. They have a long history behind that. There's a, you, you sort of brought, him, brought us into the next point, really, which is the sort of a summing up uh, in terms of the heritage. Um, in other words, what should Chicano people, what should black people take from their historical experience? What is there that, that they should zero in on, focus on? And uh, maybe you'd like to go into uh, oh, well, the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo yeah. is one specific thing. Well, I, I, believe, uh, I believe that, in fact, the Chicanos, uh, person with other people here in the United States, we, in fact, being a conquered people, we do have a document uh, that states our rights in the Southwest. Why it hasn't been, shall I say, uh, used as a... Uh, Tell as us a, more about it. Well, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which ended the hostilities between Mexico and the United States, in which and where uh, Mexico loses over half of her territory, it really stipulated the rights of the people that were going to remain here. Under the treaty, they gave the Mexican-Americans here they, they gave them one year to decide whether they were going to stay here or they are going to return to Mexico. At that time, there were from approximately 65,000 to 80,000 Mexicans, Americans, that decided to stay here. And this is the base of the people here in the Southwest now. Now, this group has been fed by subsequent waves of immigration from Mexico, illegal and legal. To show you uh, the, the importance of knowing that that border is, in fact, a nebulous, mythical border, today immigration figures... Uh, uh, approximate that there are approximately 400,000 illegal aliens in Mexico, in California from Mexico, illegal. And it's always been like this. So to us, to the Mexican people, whether they're from over there or from here, the border is just an extension from Mexico. It is not a cultural extension. It is not. It, to us, it's just a political border. And this is very important when you study the Mexican-American people in contrast, say, to the blacks. 
is that in fact we here, being indigenous to the area, we have set, shall I say, the foundations of the bas basic industries in this area. And I'm talking about mining, sheep industry, cattle industry, etc. even the, in, in the field of agriculture with irrigation. And there have never, never yet have they given us that, shall I say, even that, which is so evident and should be evident to people that do research in this area. How about, uh, Jerry, what do you think is the fundamental heritage of the black man over the first two centuries, two and a half centuries, and from 1619 to after the Civil War? Well, I think the fundamental heritage have been slavery. I think this is one of the tragic aspects of history, and I think that's why it's important to go beyond uh, our experience here in America so that we can have some examples of pride because uh, we are constantly confronted with slavery and we being a passive people and that we enjoy slavery and that we were just conditioned for slavery. But, uh, and that before we came over here as slaves, that we were an uncivilized people. So I think if we can start learning true history, our true heritage before we came over here to America as slaves and were dehumanized, I think this would give us some examples of pride, which I think is very necessary for the black youth t today, because I think this is part of the whole emphasis today on black history, and that is to give the black youth some s sense of pride in his heritage and uh, give him a sense of having real heroes and not just romanticizing history just for the sake of romanticizing it, but actually giving him some lessons in history in which he can learn and benefit for the future. And I think this is very important to uh, Jerry, black youth. It's important, I suppose, to know that someone like Frederick Douglass was fighting for his people's freedom uh, at a time when Abraham Lincoln uh, was voting for a fugitive slave law, or uh, 1848, or that a Martin Delaney as early as 1856, 1857, was arguing that black people would not get justice in this country and ought to find another homeland. Uh, and Delaney himself went back to Africa and was perhaps the first uh, black man, one of the very first, to discuss this history of the African heritage that you talked about. Okay, let me, let me throw you a curve now, since uh, we've all been in agreement here. Uh, the curve has to do with, with myth and reality. Uh, I was talking to a uh, black student, freshman, uh, and he said, uh, for instance, uh, the, in Africa, uh, the African peoples trusted one another, and that's the only reason that, that the white man was able to move in and enslave them. Um, and the question I'm asking you, and I'm going to throw another question like that at uh, Phil, is, um, you know, is there a danger that uh, black history or Chicano history will build up a series of heroic myths and will talk only about the good things in the people's past and none of the, the bad things, so to speak? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt that... Uh we have had our bad parts of history, but I think what's significant is that we start having some, uh, some examples that will benefit us and that will uplift us because uh, these have been the things that have been lacking in our history in the past. And uh, in terms of building up, I don't think we really have to worry about building up any myth that would, uh, would destroy uh, the image of the black man because it's been so uh, deflated in the past that I think any type of uh, uh, history that would uh, uplift the black man is good and uh, I don't think we really have to concern ourselves with uh, distorting it at this time because I think all history is distorted in the sense that it's, it's, uh, it's presented to build up the people that they're, they're, they're uh, presenting. And I think this is the same thing with black history. I think white history is the same. Chicano history. So I don't think black people should really be concerned with uh, destroying their own history now. I think the important thing we should be concerned with is building a history because our history has been destroyed in the past. Okay. Phil, I have one bad one for you too. Um, you have a, a problem, don't you, in distinguishing between the fact that, that one of your cultural ancestors, namely Cortez, destroyed another of your co cultural ancestors, uh, Montezuma. What I'm asking you about is because the Chicano past is a past that's compounded of, of Spanish and Indian cultural elements, and these were, in many cases, in conflict. Um, how do you put these together? 
Well, I think the Mexican has always been in conflict, and I think because the reason because the fact that it wasn't until, until, say, really the Mexican Revolution that, in fact, people began to realize, Mexicans themselves, that, in fact, they were more Indian than Spanish. I would think that the, about the only thing a Mexican is, uh, about Hispanic, would probably be he has certain institutions like probably the religious, which I still think it's uh, idols behind altars. And I also feel that the Spanish language is uh, one of the few things we have from Spain as a Mexican. I think we are more mestizo. Me Me Mexico is, uh, is really a mestizo country, a mestizo being a fusion between the Spanish and the, and the Indian. I think we're more Indian, not only what we eat, not only in how we think, but I think in how we live. I think, and I'm not talking about that stereotype Indian with walking around wigwams and teepees and all this stuff. I think in the, the philosophy is more Indian. Uh, I think if uh, we go back to see, uh, look back in our history, look at Cortes, the Mexicans will look at Cortes as one of the first gauchupines, or the exploiters of the Indians. We look more to, any way I do for the answer for the Mexican, more to the Indian heritage. I, I consider the effect, but you realize it was never really more than a million if that, uh, Hispanics that came to the New World. And not all of them came to Mexico. And uh, what this did to, at the time that Cortes came in, of over 20, a little over 20 million people that they estimate was there, I think was just a drop in the bucket. Uh, I really think today those people are really uh, kidding themselves. Those Mexicans or Mexican-Americans or Chicanos that think they are Spanish-Americans or Hispanic-Americans. I think if we're anything else, we're more Indian than Hispanic. And I look at uh, Cortes personally as a historian, as the one that started the whole thing. And I look at Marina, the Malinche, as they call her, as the first uh, traitor to the Indian nation of Mexico, or to the Aztecs. And uh, I consider the, the Spaniards' intrusion into the Americas not any more, uh, not any different than I consider the European, or the Northern European intrusion on the Eastern seaboard against the Indians. I see it the same way, only they were just in two different types of animals, but they were Europeans. So I guess you gentlemen would agree with the Harvard philosopher George Santayana, one of the great American philosophers who finally left this country because he thought, didn't really like the way it was going, he thought it was too materialistic. But oh, back about 50 years ago, Santayana once said that, that um, a myth isn't half as safe as the truth. That you know, you, you may dream the myth, but one of these days you just, you go sleepwalking to fall off a cliff. Um, you would agree, I guess, then, that the, the best way to approach the history of, of your peoples is to tell it like it is. is that right? I would agree, and I think one important thing is that we have not had many black historians, you know, and I think once black people start telling their history, then I think we can decide as to whether it's myth or reality, but uh, I think it's time, you know, that black people start telling their own history. Uh, as Ron Karinga uh, says, uh, the leader of us organization in L.A., he calls um, uh, U.S. history his story, the white man's story, you know. So I think history is basically the story of a people, you know, and I think it's time that black people start telling their story. If, may I say something? If historians began teaching history and researching history as history and not just as, a, as, image, uh, as image making with footnotes, uh, I think we'd begin to uh, go on the right track. As myself, as a as teaching Chicano history, for example, Mexican Americanist, I am teaching actually the history of, of, of the continent, of the American continent. And I'm just trying to place everything in its proper perspective as much as possible. But even though I've become biased, which is very easy for a historian to do, uh, I think that it'll all balance out sometime, one of these days, somewhere like this, where you'll have enough Mexican-Americans writing history and doing it. You'll have American historians or Anglo-Saxon Americans writing it and blacks. And hopefully one of these days, we might just go together and say, you, myself, and you, we could start writing the history of the, of the United States together as a, as a project. And this is what will balance it out. We'll give our images, we'll, we'll build up our heroes, and we'll put it down as it is. I guess the trouble right now is mostly, uh, you know, there hasn't been enough of your history and your history. It's all my history. Um, briefly, since we have a few minutes left, um, you might want to suggest to some of our students, uh, since I don't think they'll get another chance, what they might want to look for in the 17B class, the history of the United States since the Civil War era, since, since Civil War era and Reconstruction. Um, about black history, Gerald? Well, I think uh, an important approach 
to a 17B would to make uh, the history contemporary, like comparing maybe the Reconstruction era with uh, what's happening today in terms of uh, the many opportunities that are being op opened up to blacks now, and uh, uh, analyze these trends of Reconstruction and how it compares to uh, the present day situation. And I think using examples of the past and comparing with uh, today, I think is a very important part of studying history. And I think this would be a very valuable way of approaching uh, History 17B, using examples of the past and comparing with today. And since uh, 17B does deal with contemporary times, I think this would be very effective. I remember in, in dealing with this with some high school teachers that I was teaching in Atlanta, we were talking about what kind of black history to project. And um, one of the things I was getting, especially from some of the older teachers, um, was that the emphasis should be upon the black men who have made it. Um, uh, Thurgood Marshall and William Hasty and Marian Anderson and Leontine Price. Um, and my feeling is that, that the one problem with this, and, and, and these people at the same time said, uh, you know, why should we talk about Charlie Parker or Malcolm X? You know? um, and my feeling is that, that this kind of is one-sided. Would you, any comments on that? Or? I agree. Um, and I, along these same lines, I think uh, certain mass movements that have had a very profound impact on, on the black people of this country are groups like uh, Marcus Garvey, who organized around 5 million black people during the 20s. And also, I think currently, um, Elijah Muhammad, you know, and the, the Muslims here in this country, I think they're doing a very effective job of doing something for the masses of black people. But these type of examples are not used. It's always the, the people like uh, Dr. Brooks mentioned that have made it in the society, you know, and the people that are struggling. And the people, the leaders that are concerned with the masses of the people are never projected because uh, these, uh, they usually slander them some kind of way so that they're not used as examples for the people. Also, I suppose the, the problem is that these are people who have made it according to the white or Anglo standard. Correct. What would we look for in uh, the history of the Mexican-American people in you the would last look, hundred you years? Would look for, you would look for the direction or the happenings in American history that had a direct effect on where the Chicano is today. I am talking about the laws, like I pointed out, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Japanese Gent the Gentleman Agreement. I would look for what happened during the Depression, the 1930s, for example, to the mass forced repatriation that I call it back to Mexico on the part of our existing agents or welfare agencies, back to Mexico, of close to 400,000 Chicanos, and over most of them, or half of them, at least, American citizens. People don't know about this, but what effect did this have on the Mexican-American. This is what I'd look for. I'd look for, for example, how, who were the first people or divisions, say, in World War II, looking at the military in Corregidor? Who were the first people that were brought into for, who came up to meet the challenge in protecting that, that uh, our documents have told us for a long time in this country we had? Who were they? This is never brought up in American history that I have seen. And also to see what happened during the Korean War how many defectors were, in fact, from the Mexican-American War, as far as saying whether they're really you Americans. Mean, you mean Mexican-Americans. Mexican-Americans, precisely. How many? And to also see how the agribusiness in this country and the immigration laws have been used, in fact, to keep the Mexican-American in the fields and in the factories, and to look at the way uh, certain people here in the United States from the turn of the century have in fact looked to Mexico and the Mexican-American group as a source of cheap labor. This is what I'd look for, for to know why today the Chicano is reacting the way he is. Also to see today in contemporary those people like Reyes Tijerina, those people like Corky Gonzalez, those people like out here on the west coast of the Cesar Chavez and his movement, to see what effect they're having on total society. And whether they, to see whether they're historians are placing it in the proper perspective, you see. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, too, we really owe some sort of apology to the fact that uh, the Japanese Americans who, uh, you know, who were almost all whipped up in a, in a really racist thing and, and put into concentration camps because uh, in World War II, at a time when German Americans and Italian Americans were 
trusted as loyal citizens, but Japanese as Orientals uh, were suspicious. Um, and uh, the Attorney General of California then, Earl Warren, who has been such a friend to civil rights and civil liberties in America, uh, only 25, 30 years ago, 1941, went before the United States Congress and said, either you people do something about these, these untrustworthy aliens, or the people of California will have to take the law into their own hands. So, well, don't you think that that is part of this Germanic influence that has affected this country, the, the, the foundations of this country, where, in fact, you know as an American historian that the fifth column was more one of the most detrimental things to the war effort here in the United States. And yet, why did they intern the Germans, as you stated? It was very easy to intern the Orioles. I think this is this ethnocentricity that we have had in the development of this history at various times in the 30s with the Mexican-Americans, let's get them off of the relief rolls back to Mexico during the 40s with the Japanese that you just mentioned, but to the fact that yet most people know about what happened to the Japanese in the Orientals, but they don't know about the forced repatriation in the 30s. You see, they don't know this. They don't know how many people were led back to the east to work in the factories back there, Chicanos, and led through the streets, for example, as slaves, as slaves. I think another good uh, example of the very point that you're making is uh, dealing with contemporary history as it is, like reading a book like Man Child in the Promised Land, where Claude Brown tells how it is to grow up in a slum, a ghetto such as Harlem, you know, and all the problems that he's confronted with, the slow death that takes place in the ghettos throughout America. I think this is very significant when you're dealing with American history, especially contemporary history, as to what's still happening to uh, black Chicanos and other minorities in this country. So what both of you gentlemen are suggesting, too, is that so long as American history, and it's of course, this is the traditional way history was taught, focuses primarily on the presidents and the generals and the, the politicians rather than the people, uh, the people who do the work that actually builds the country, uh, then there is going to be a tendency, of course, to leave out the minority peoples who, who have you know, done the hard work but not gotten very much of the glory. Well, Dr. Brooks, what has been written in the United States has been, in fact, the political history of the Anglo-Saxon people in this country. It ha they have never, and even some historians have had the gall to go out and title, title their works the cultural and social history of the United States. And, uh, and yet this is not done. What, they, what has happened is they have written history, but it has been biased history. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, let me just throw one, just a numerical question. Um, by my calculations, there are somewhere upwards of 20 million black people in the United States. Is that close to accurate? Or? That's the estimate I've, I've heard most often. And, and the Census Bureau usually is low on, on this, they've admitted. Yeah. And how many uh, people of Spanish are... Well, the estimate Chicago? from the last estimate uh, of the Census last year, uh, they're right around 7 million Mexicans. Of course, there are more, they're closer to 12 million Spanish-speaking people. Puerto now, Rican and yes, Cuban Including Argen. all the Spanish-speaking. Yeah. But of uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans, in the south, mostly concentrated in the Southwest, there are there around about 7 million. So we're dealing then with something close to, uh, just the blacks and Chicanos, we're dealing with something close to 30 million people. That's uh, about 15 percent, or one-eighth of Americans whose story has been left out of the history books. Thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. Uh, I hope this has been as informative for students as it has been for me. do the same thing. We use the name interchangeably. It's just that um, in the CSU system, Afro-American Studies is the designation and, and Black Studies is like a subheading. 
Well, it got started in 1969 after um, black students and faculty working with the administration uh, drew up a proposal and submitted it to the academic vice president. So it was approved like any other department. The students who developed the proposal, you know, were not prepared academically or probably interest-wise to teach the program, but they were instrumental in getting a good, strong foundation, which uh, was a primary interest to me, and I think that's one of the reasons we've been successful and some others have, and because it had it was built into the uh, system from the beginning on a strong academic base. So m most of our courses focus around the social sciences, but we do have um, courses major, which is uh, acceptable for a single subject major for education. And uh, we offer courses, our core courses are in history, Afro-American history, which also meets the uh, state requirement for uh, U.S. history. And we have, you know, sociology of the black community, which I keep teach in psychology and economics and uh, we now have black family and black woman, which are new additions. And a lot of the courses develop depending on much of what the students' interests um, revolves around. And by that I mean, in the beginning, a lot of students seem to be interested in, you know, things like politics and nationalism and uh, some study of different kinds of movements, more or less. And we find that irrespective of who teaches this co these courses now, that uh, their interests are more along lines like, um, again, the family, uh, the woman. Um, we have a black creative expression, which is um, allows for uh, creative writing and improvisations. And so we still have the um, core of the courses that we started with, but we have expanded. And we also try to um, get the students involved as much as possible in some kind of community activity in terms of um, either projects in the classes or internships or so that in addition to the uh, book aspect and we're very strong on that and expect high performance but we also think that you know when they're reading and talking about these communities they should also have some experience so we try to get them out in different agencies um, and do different kinds of things we, um, again, I should stress, demand a lot from the students, but at the same time, we're willing to help and work with them. So we do a lot of outside of classroom work with them. And um, this is based primarily on the premise that uh, our students do have a great potential. All right, now I can tell you what's happened to some of our graduates. We've had them, uh, as you would expect, uh, some number of them are teaching on different levels. They, you know, either have gotten the credential at the same time and are in public schools or, and or junior colleges. Uh, we have uh, quite a number, it's surprising, I guess, who have either gone into personnel and or serving as affirmative action officers in industry. And this is just with a BA, not an MA. Uh, we have uh, some who are working in uh, probation, juvenile work. We have a number of our students, you know, coming through the SOCIA administration of justice uh, concept have graduated and gone into that. And I think the important point is that our graduates have the same opportunities as any other liberal arts major, which you know at this time varies. But it seems that uh, many of them have less difficulty coming out with the concentration um, in Afro-American uh, studies than some other liberal are simply because of, I guess, the uh, pressure from affirmative action uh, plus the multicultural emphasis in the school so that in some varying um, circumstances, if you have the background in some ethnic studies or other, it seems that um, for public agencies and then we find for private they are serving as uh, uh, affirmative action, resource people, and uh, many times have improved. We've had a number of people, you know, who've worked, uh, been raising a family and working and going to school and had low-level jobs. And when they graduated, their companies have plucked them to serve. I mean, you can understand why. I mean, they know the people and 
then they have the credentials. But, you know, we've been pleased that that's happening. Uh, at the best of my knowledge, all of our graduates are working. Now, uh, the other thing is um, we are encouraging as many of our students as we can to attempt to, to maybe direct their interest towards the science fields, knowing that uh, all liberal arts and, and social sciences are um, feeling the crunch from the society at large, and that's irrespective of color. So we like to encourage our students, who many of them have um, a hesitancy and sometimes a fear from their experiences in, in secondary schools of dealing with the sciences and mathematics. So this is our, the reason for our interest in the science club and attempting to develop interests along that lines, even though our program is not primarily a science, but we see that based on, I get a lot of calls from industry and um, uh, research centers that want uh, minority students to work in work study positions if they're in the, you know, if they're studying biology or math or science. And we find that as undergraduates, there are a lot more job opportunities for them than there are for our students who are just going through on a straight liberal arts. Getting our panelists. I'm trying to. Let's see. Well, then this panelist is there even more? Um, he should be in now. No, I see. I see him. This mic's muted. Yeah, so the other one. Here it is. I thought I did it. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, like. Uh, so I'd like to welcome our panelists for this segment. Uh, we have Dr. Daniel J. Valencia, who is a professor in Chicano and Chicana Studies here at San Jose State, and Nathaniel Moore, who is an archivist at the UC Berkeley Ethnic Studies Library, um, significant because UC Berkeley is one of two campuses that was the origin of ethnic studies. And uh, Nathaniel also, in 2019, curated an exhibit called Whose University, the 50th Anniversary of the UC Berkeley Third World Liberation Front Strike. So welcome to you both. If if camera is possible, we would love to see your faces, but I know that's not always possible. Um, the first thing I'd like to ask each of you is for your initial reactions to the film, or the films that we just saw. What did it make you think about? Uh, we can start with Danny. Okay, um, I was I was trying to start my video, uh, but it won't work for some reason. Oh, um, I wonder if it's a permissions issue. Yeah. Okay, please, please keep talking. <laughs> I, I'll just go ahead. I mean, as far as uh, what was said, <clears throat> the content, um, I think that just the film, uh, uh, the films gives us insight into kind of the origins, the beginnings of uh, like non-white perspectives within academia um, and at San Jose State specifically, um, specific to the the Chicano perspective and the African American or or the Black uh, perspective, and um, as far as that goes, much of what they said for the most part remains uh, relevant in today's world. I think. Um, <clears throat> The importance of, of continuing to challenge the institutional forces and, and consequences of colonization for black and brown populations. Um, the film also speaks to the importance of, of uh, being able to research, to teach, to learn about uh, who, who we are at, as, uh, in my case, people of, of Mexican origin <clears throat> versus being told who we are by, by dominant white ideology. Um, so to me, the, uh, this speaks to the power of representation, um, but more importantly, to the power of self-definition and the ability to, to define ourselves through being able to express our own experiences, uh, which uh, brings us to the relevance of film in, in kind of recovering and, and creating, disseminating this, uh, this knowledge not only among Chicanos, but broadly speaking within the, the greater significance of ethnic studies. 
Um, I mean, as, as far as the, the film, the role of film goes, especially in, in the longer uh, film, mm -hmm. I think it obviously falls under the, the category of a, a documentary because, uh, you know, it documents, uh, it documents through interviews the perspectives of Black and brown populations, which have historically been silenced, marginalized. So I, I would say that... Um, The, the, this documentary falls under the traditions established by the Chicano movement, although because it's essentially an interview that was filmed, it doesn't necessarily incorporate some of the more artistic or cultural elements more readily witnessed within the rise of Chicano movement and some of the films inspired by the movement. Um, do you want me to keep going or... <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a I think that's a, a a great start, and then we'll we'll I want to hear a little bit from Nathaniel, and then we'll we can continue the um, the conversation. Sounds good. Uh, uh, and it looks like we got Nathaniel on film on video film video. Uh, is is Danny also? Okay, so Danny, you should be able to turn on your video now. Yes. Okay. Progress. There we are. Um, Nathaniel, what were your kind of initial thoughts on seeing those films? Well, uh, thanks for inviting me, Carly. Uh, it's good to be in space with everyone who's there that I can't see. And uh, thank you for your comments, Danny. Um, I just, I'm just going to bring up a couple things and then, you know, uh, whether it be questions or questions from you, Carly, or questions from the audience, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, one thing that I definitely appreciated just as an archivist and someone who's approaching things through that lens I definitely appreciated the, the the films for what they were as archival content to actually be able to see and hear people uh, and get a sense of what issues um, folks were navigating in uh, during that time period, which I would agree uh, are many of the same issues uh, that you know folks are still dealing with today. Uh, but I really appreciated that and. Uh, You know, I, I want to applaud the library and the departments for the resources to actually be able to preserve and digitize the films. Um, I heard a lot from, especially in the first film, uh, around the pedagogy, the content, and the people who actually are tasked with the instruction about why ethnic studies are necessary. Um, and so that was, I thought they did a very nice job of setting that stage. Um, One thing that I appreciated about the second film, uh, which certainly ring true through my engagement with the historical materials at UC Berkeley, is the uh, impact of the, fa the fact that the programs were student generated. Um, yes, a collaboration with the administration, but in fact, it was young people who are really leading the charge for this type of educational content. I think that's really important, especially if we think about how uh, ways in which to empower our, the students on campuses today. Uh, and the, the last piece that comes to mind around the second film is also then the grounding in, it's not just about what's happening in the academy, but what's happening in the community is also a key component of, uh, in this case, Black and Chicano studies, but ethnic studies as an umbrella, that you know, engagement with community is a key component not just of the academic training, but in fact that the uh, community plays a role in what the education actually looks like. Um, the, I'll just kind of conclude with one of the things that wasn't in the film, but uh, I know that I've been lucky enough to engage is, you know, we heard from some of the faculty, we heard from like, uh, I don't want to say support staff, but folks in charge of student support Uh, departments, uh, but we didn't hear from any students. And so one of the things that, at least in the archives at UC Berkeley, and I'm sure to some extent, both at San Jose State University and other universities, are the student perspectives of why this is important. And I think that when you add that, you get a really resounding um, view of uh, the struggle for liberatory education. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, Any questions from the audience? Anything you'd like to ask or even comments? 
Well, I'll give an example. Uh, my sister is a retired fifth grade teacher and her grandson's school, she was helping volunteering at, and this was last year. Then she took a group out to go over part of the history lesson. And so the instructor gave it the textbook to go over it. And it started and said, civilization in California started 400 years ago. And she stopped right there and closed the book and said, this is not right. And this was a California approved textbook last year. Um, to bring it forward to yesterday, um, I was on a Zoom of biodiversity in the national and state parks. And they were talking about what they're trying to do to sustain the state parks and all, and especially the redwoods. And they were talking about burning the redwoods, mm -hmm. which is an indigenous project uh, process of what they used to do. Mm -hmm. And it kind of hit me today when they were talking about what my sister had said that, you know, civilization, how we as some Anglos see it, started 400 years ago or a thousand years ago people were living here and protected our forests mm -hmm. and now we're coming around to accept their practices as the only way to protect our forests so it's kind of like i think it's important that we look at look at issues from all uh, points of view we talked about the asian one and someone mentioned that People knew about uh, the Japanese internment camps. That's not the case. I have some very close friends that grew up in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And when they moved to California, I think we were talking about a trip to Manzanar and telling about this internment camp. And they had no idea what it was. And these are college educated women who uh, had no idea of what we had done, what the United States had done, especially the West Coast to mm -hmm. our uh, primarily Japanese American uh, uh, citizens. Thank you, Carolyn. Any other questions or comments from the audience? I have more to ask our panel. I just don't want to hog the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Danny, maybe well, for both of you, but we'll start with Danny. Uh, you can talk a little bit about how the discipline of ethnic studies is, has maybe changed or stayed the same uh, since those films were made. Did you hear anything that made you think, oh, that we think about that differently now, or we've added to that idea, or um, you know, do the fundamentals remain the same? I think the the foundational elements are most definitely still there. Um, I mean, <clears throat> in a way, it, you know, if this wasn't uh, in in black and white, and obviously, I'm not sure when they were uh, produced. I, I'm assuming like in the in the seventies, sometime maybe early seventies. I think so. I don't have the dates in front of me, but I think so. <clears throat> Yeah, but um, I mean, much of what they were saying as far as the ethnic studies curriculum and, and the classes and what the students, um, you know, are learning, it it, it kind of resonates with with uh, some of the still uh, some of the things that are still happening um, in today's society. Um, for me, anyway, that that that's what I um, took from it. Mm -hmm. Nathaniel, any thoughts on that? Um, maybe two, I, I think there could be any number of things, but two kind of come to mind. Uh, I think that one of the things that in the way that I understand the history of the discipline, um, the first couple of years or even the first decade, um, it, it, it wasn't a professionalized field necessarily. Like, um, so, you know, even if it's just beginning in 1960, if, if 1969, 1970 is the first year you could possibly get a degree in ethnic studies, then um, one of the things, you know, 50 some years later is it's, it's more professionalized. You know, I could get a degree in ethnic studies and then get a job in that field to some degree. Um, and so I think that has changed probably for the better, right? In the sense of um, it's it's good to be able to support yourself uh, with this type of educational content. Um, 
And I think that in that way, some of kind of the activist core of the discipline might also look a little different. I think that there is a tension between professionalism and say being an activist around you know different issues. Um, and so I think that navigating that has just changed one way, you know, in probably a number of different ways um, since the beginning. Uh, and then the other thing, and I don't think that they use this term, but I know that, you know, given the history at UC Berkeley, I know they did. Um, third world doesn't exactly mean the same thing that it did, that it, today the definition of third world does not mean the same thing as it did in the, in 1969. And so also as kind of global dynamics and language um, change, the field changes, I guess, thinking about that, you know, maybe the emphasis on third world doesn't exist as much today, but certainly the focus on gender and sexuality may be more definitive in the field than it was in 1969, as an example. And so just, again, like this is one of the reasons why I was really appreciating the archival content of the film, because it both shows you how things have stayed the same, but also in some instances, how things actually have changed. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for being here. We can give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about four minutes until our next segment starts. So if you wanna stretch, drink some soda, eat some candy, <laughs> open those bags of popcorn that are too crinkly when the films are going. <laughs> if you stayed for three or more segments, you want to reward yourself if you had tote bags and scarves here. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the question? I don't know. It's not a minority history. It's a minority history. But yeah, it wasn't. We don't like put out. I think it was part of the research on television theory. So I don't know. I don't know. Is there someone that we could touch those? So, oh, thank you for reminding me to say this out loud. Um, at around 4 p.m. today, our campus films collection is going to go live at filmcollection.sjp.edu. Mm -hmm. um, not every film that we're showing today is up there yet, but uh, uh, what the ones we did watch are. And we're adding over to the collection. Individual collections. That SAS is that can be the top of the Google SAS is that it won't turn on until four o'clock today. Yeah. Are you ready? It's nice to see in person. I have you in library days on all 21. Oh, just, okay. Angel. Angel, hi. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm getting ready to teach this class during the spring semester. Oh, nice. In person. In person. Wow. How are you doing? You know, where you at with your studies? How are you going? Oh, let's say it's in the end. It's a gene. After I think I need your what is your other report? Yeah, chemical engineer. Okay. So, I didn't care what you can tell you. It was like my thing. You know, it's like something I want to learn more about it. And then, you know, I'm here and decide to make a change. I found a lot of it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Good. And then I'm doing a minor in journalism, okay. which is very, very awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm not writing the newspaper about this. Yeah. Are you writing the Spartan or whatever? Uh, the Pele. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that in this semester. Oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's interesting. My my sister and some of his she did the reverse. Major in journalism, but minor in film studies. That's good. I don't know if you have to hear me join now. And there are some of the elected old clips. Could you imagine? Like, these are people being interviewed. So, you know, you could be journalists. That's like, what is that? I mean, you can't find them, right? And like students 20 years from now will see you in your clip. I saw a video about people in sport in Iowa and she oh. saw our Title IX question four. So when are you thinking of what do you think of Bradford? Uh this coming spring. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So our next segment uh, focuses on women's studies. We have one short film, and uh, one of our panelists, Bonnie Sugama, is not able to make it. Um, in fact, is here, so we will have a conversation right now. It's, it's not, not that big of a program. program. It isn't a major. No one would ever uh, take a four-year thing in it. It is, a, it is an official minor as of this fall. I would say there are three major um, kind of underpinnings to the program and, and motivating things about it. The first thing uh, in women's studies is that uh, when we, we realized, and it is kind of a new realization, that oftentimes when people talk about the study of man, uh, that although everyone thought for a long time it meant people and all human beings or mankind, it oftentimes is the case that really uh, the talk was about males and uh, that many fields, history, psychology, sociology, a variety of social science disciplines, fields of study, uh, are lacking because they haven't really focused on women. And so our major idea was to try to correct the situation and um, it's been very fruitful and very exciting. Uh, the second thing is that uh, Women's Studies wants to uh, try to bring uh, more women to the campus both from the standpoint of faculty, women, uh, and, and more students and encourage women students to come to the campus and uh, even more so stay in because as many people know, there is more of an attrition of women students than of men students. Now, along with this, uh, another uh, interesting development in this part of, of what we're talking about is that men students, uh, as well, are quite interested in this program. And it's not surprising that they would be because, after all, uh, it's half of the, of the people in the world and, uh, and um, the mysterious relationships between men and women are fascinating. And, so we find that a number of our classes have uh, many men enrolled in them as well. Now the third thing uh, is we, we would we like to, and we're not the only program on campus that's doing this, but we put a lot of emphasis on the mode of teaching. We try to uh, have the students uh, relate what they're studying in the courses uh, to their lives experiences and vice versa uh, so that each one enriches the other and that it isn't uh, an abstract uh, kind of a of an exercise which isn't really speaking to their their interests and their and their problems and needs and uh, so we think that both the uh, study itself and the people that are taking it will be enriched because of that playback and forth um, we have as for fall 
this coming fall, we have about um, 20, some, somewhere around 20 different courses in about 15 uh, departments uh, across different schools, not all just in the School of Social Sciences. Um, humanities, in literature, um, in uh, health science, uh, some in home economics are part of ours, and then history, history of women in the United States, uh, women in politics in the political science department, and uh, then our own courses that we have developed, the study of women uh, that we offer se several sections of, some at night because we want to, you know, tap uh, a variety of people. I wouldn't want people to take women's studies thinking that it was going to have a great deal of obvious practical use. I think that would be unfair uh, to sell it that way. It is something that will expand people's horizons, will make uh, them be able to, to lead a fuller life and open up things to them that perhaps they hadn't thought of before. Uh, and the people that we have taking it uh, do it for several reasons um, that as far as you can tell from what they tell you. One is um, that they, they, want, they simply want to know more about this. It's an intellectual curiosity sort of thing, and they find it quite a rich program. And one of the things that they like about it is that it is so new, and so that when they do, for instance, papers, they're not uh, going and rehashing uh, a bunch of things that, that have already been done 100 times over. They're actually doing things that are new and exciting to them. For instance, one uh, woman who signed up for, you mentioned Dr. Billy Jensen in the history department for her course. Um, her grandmother was reared in uh, Brigham Young's, uh, was one of Brigham Young's daughters. And so she lived in a uh, polygamous family. And so this student uh, had kind of known about that in the family, but just hadn't looked at it systematically. So she went and interviewed her grandmother at great length in an oral history project by, on tape and then, and then wrote this up and it just fascinating and, and it was a real contribution uh, to knowledge. So it's that sort of thing that people are doing that uh, is quite, quite a, an adventure. But it's not a practical uh, professional kind of degree. It is a helping, uh, it isn't a degree at all, it is, it's a helping program rather than something that will equip you to do something uh, strictly uh, teach you a skill or, or something of that kind. Okay, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tanya Becker up to the table. And uh, Tanya is the program coordinator for women, gender, and sexuality studies, this degree that's not very practical. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oops. yeah, I know it's it was centered this that. morning. It's not anymore. I love that. It's all good. Um. So, what were your first thoughts on seeing? This yeah, I mean, it's kind of similar to what the speakers before were saying. You know, it's it's. I don't know if it's funny or depressing. Um or maybe a little bit of both, like how things have changed and how things have stayed the same, mm -hmm. you know? Um, also the thing I just, as a footnote, cannot get over is like, I recognize DMH, all this furniture is still <laughs> like pretty much the same. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, just thinking of like, kind of the history of women's studies as an academic, you know, field, um, kind of growing out of, a lot of work that was being done with the civil rights movement and race and ethnic studies actually um, kind of coming, you know, both of these kind of interdisciplinary fields kind of coming up at the same time. And um, a lot of classes, a lot of women's studies classes kind of around the country were started by graduate students or, you know, people who just were kind of fed up with how limited the, how limited the perspective of what, the classes that they were taking were. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these were like graduate students who were just like, well, I'm going to teach women in literature because my literature class doesn't have a single, you know, woman author on the syllabus or what have you. Um, and so in that way, you know, the first department of women's study, the first official department of women's studies um, was at San Diego State University. And 
Um, I had the privilege of doing my master's in women's studies there, and it was it was a really awesome program with a lot, you know steeped in a lot of history. But San Jose State wasn't too far behind, you know. I mean, we've had women's studies here since um, the early '70s as well, and um, you know we just only this year is the first year that our program is offering a major in women gender sexuality studies. So, you know, I was like 1974, you know, the, the woman saying, you know, we just offer a minor, we're not a major. It's like, well, it took, you know, almost 50 years to um, 49 years. Am I doing math right? Yeah, 49 years to uh, get to the point where it's a, a major. And there's been a lot of institutional barriers along the way. We're still very, very under supported. Um, and and it, it's frustrating. That part is really frustrating because that's very real for me. Mm-hmm. It's like you're trying to build something, you're trying to create something, you're trying to move something forward. The issues are still relevant. The stu- you know the students are craving this knowledge. They want to have. They want to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's like the fact I had to recently reframe for myself, the fact that we're still here Mm. is actually pretty radical Mm. and remarkable. You know, like the phrase like um, existence is resistance, right? Like we're still here. Mm. So that's, that's kind of nothing short of amazing considering all the iterations and Mm. kind of um, just, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but like, kicking the can down the road that the that the institution has done around women gender, well, what's now women gender sexuality studies. Um, and yeah, those are just my initial, my initial thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the discipline has evolved over time? Yeah. Knowledge, I mean, starting with the name, right? Not, not yeah, anymore. right. So, um, you know, I, I think the initial sort of iteration of women's studies classes again this is not just at San Jose State but like in the field in general was what um, scholars called out like add women and stir sort of approach which is like okay we're you know we're looking at women in history so we'll, we'll just kind of like to a, to a large extent take the take the the methods and the framework of the of that discipline and sort of like add women to it and I but I think that one of the intentions of women's studies, like what they said, what the speaker said in the film, was to really challenge the pedagogy itself and, you know, the format of the classroom, how we conceptualize what knowledge is. And um, bringing, you know, I think that's one of the things that's that's pretty radical about whether you want to call it women's studies or women and gender studies or what have you, that it's still very radical today is kind of bringing those those voices from the margins and centering them. Um, and then over time, you know, um, there was, you know, discussions around like intersections of identity and then gender itself, right, starts to kind of become a more nuanced conversation. And in terms of the title of these programs, there's been a lot of push and pull about like, should we change, should should we drop women altogether? Should it be called gender studies? Should it be called women and gender studies? Should it be called women, gender, sexuality studies, right? So it's like, we here at San Jose State, I was part of that conversation in 2012 to uh, change from women's studies to women and gender, women, gender, and sexuality studies. And that was done with the intention of kind of representing the work that the faculty did more accurately. So we did have a faculty member who did like masculinity studies and we had um, faculty members who were as- affiliated with the program that were doing, um, you know, LGBT studies type stuff. But we also wanted to really make sure that we highlight the history of women's studies. So we, so, you know, we had a really intense discussion about like, well, we don't want to drop women from the title Mm -hmm. because we want to signal that like 
there's a history here Mm -hmm. of women's studies. So, and so even a faculty member who's doing masculinity studies is doing it through the lens lens of, yes. And so there was even a discussion of like, should we call it feminist studies? And, you know, so there's, there's contention in different, different programs around the country. This is still an issue. I just was at the national women's studies association conference a couple weeks ago. And this is still an issue. It was like, should we, you know, some people have changed the names of their programs to try to make it more palatable to an institution that's hostile to them. So I think, I think we made the right decision here um, to, to really kind of acknowledge where we come from and also expand to, to represent like what people were, what the faculty were actually teaching and doing in their work. Thank you. Uh, When we spoke the other day, you had highlighted that twice during the film the the uh person speaking is saying this is not a practice this is not a practical degree and and you've given some kind of like a subtext of that or <laughs> reasons behind that emphasizing that yeah it's so funny um yeah again it's like I always say that women gender sexuality studies is making a deal with the devil right you are exi- you are you are an academic field in an institution that by its nature is patriarchal and colonizing. Mm -hmm. So you exist in a place that doesn't really want you there, you know? Um, And I think one of the ways that, you know, maybe at this time to sort of I, I don't know. I don't know the politics around that, but I, I I would definitely, you know, if I were to to meet that professor now, I would probably, you know, really challenge her on that and say, like, no, it is a really practical degree. It's like these are the world skills that we need now. No matter what, this is what I say to my students too, is like it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're going into tech, if you're going into human resources, if you're going into the law, if you're going into the nonprofit sector, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you need this critical analysis of race, class, gender, sexuality, about power, how power is operating, how knowledge is constructed. Like those are transferable skills. It doesn't matter what you're doing, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, thank so, you. Yeah. Um, yeah, she said, um, it won't teach you a skill. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, it will teach you a skill. Right, right. It will teach you a really important skill, which is like how to think. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Any questions from our audience or comments. Did, yeah. did, did you have a, a, a question? Um, going back to the point where you have to, the whole, you and the faculty had to change the name. Uh, how hard is to is it change the name from women's studies to women in gender e- e- equity studies? Am I saying it right? Women, gender, and sexuality studies. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, um, sort of, logistically it wasn't that hard you know um but it but it it was a challenge in that just sort of his so to give you like some context um women's study called women's studies at the time was in a department called social interdisciplinary social science and it was in a department with asian american studies and a teacher preparation program social science teacher preparation program and there was a sociology department. And at one point, um, this was around 2011, 2012, for the reason, you know, the reasons that it always administrators always say to like rearrange the furniture in the room, they said, well, you can either merge with sociology or we will merge you. (laughs) So we were like, well, I guess we'll do it ourselves, you know, and, um, and it was fortuitous in that there were three faculty member in, members in sociology who did feminist work. They were, they were doing it from a sociological perspective and, and women, gender, sexuality studies is historically interdisciplinary, but it, it, it worked. Right. And, um, and that's when we had, you know, kind of that, that really intense conversation about like, should we just be, call ourselves gender studies? Should we just call ourselves feminist studies? It was kind of like, we had to kind of reflect on like, well, what are we actually doing here? And what is actually, you know, like our mission and what we care about and what we want to, um, you know, provide for the students in, in terms of like 
academically and pedagogically. And for all of us at the time, you know, intersectionality was really important, making sure that we understood and looked at and taught about gender in a in an intersectional way where we were really also simultaneously looking at issues of race and class and sexual identity and disability and citizenship and global politics, right? Like we can't, you can't just look at one of those threats. You have to look at the sort of web that they all create together. Um, so, so that was, I mean, it was good. It was a good conversation to have, but it was interesting, right? To like kind of see where people were coming from. Yeah, we have time for one more. Okay, I have a comment about the 70s. It's about 50-50 percent. So when I first started college, it was still the, there was a majority of uh, males. But by the time I got back here in 75, it was pretty much 50 percent female, 50 percent male. And so that kind of started a string of things. And then my, my minor was in psychology. And one of the things I noticed right off the bat most of the studies that had all been conducted right. in psychology were on male subjects. Yeah. And everything, again, I think that you mentioned there's someone that the perception of a person was a male perception right. and not a female perception yeah. or both that we can have. Yeah. Both. And the same thing in the sciences. You know, most of our yeah. early research was all scientifically conducted on males. And most of the doctors were males, so they treated us from a male perspective. And not that hasn't changed too much, I have to say. And, you know, that's like one exercise I actually give my students at the beginning of the semester is like, take an inventory of your syllabi, right? Like how many women, how many non-binary folks, how many trans folks, how many people of color, how many people with disabilities, like how many non-citizens, like what's the diversity of, your, your professor is telling you a story about the world in from the perspective of their field. What is that story? You know, and that's why I think it's still really important to have programs like women's studies and ethnic studies that are like hardy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I will start the next segment in three minutes. I did, and one of the things that really caught so, so interesting is that the difference between Title IX back in the day compared to now is so different. And, and for me, as a big generation today, I think that's kind of 
sexual abuse in the South. But back in back in during the days, it was mostly of how powerful become equal. Mm -hmm. I work both with men and women. And so we began to elaborate a little bit more in that air time how how we went from equal men up to yeah. sex abuse. Yeah. 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 Which is very powerful for me as a good generation. We don't have an issue with the power of 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 by Jesse Hernandez, where we'll hear more about after we watch the film. Um, and it's showing the footage is the 1968 Chicano commencement.
Please come on up and I'm trying to get the I wonder why sometimes it's letting me not in the middle of that. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm welcoming welcoming to the table Alfred, Alfred Hernandez, who is the son of the person who shot the film, uh, Jesse Hernandez. And he's also an artist, educator, and a filmmaker. And online, we have Dr. Armando Valdez, who is a former faculty here at San Jose State, also an alumni and one of the organizers of the original Chicano commencement. I want to start by asking you, Alfred, can you tell us a little bit about your father? Uh, well, one thing that's interesting is that my dad had bought a camera. And so what I've realized that a lot of Chicanos at the time, you're not finding a lot of people who owned movie cameras. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that he wasn't necessarily employed to do this. Nobody told him to do this. It was he uh, was already a teacher at the time, and he decided to to uh, get involved with Chicano activities here in San Jose State. But it's just kind of interesting because this is, this is the film <laughs> that goes into the camera. It's actually taking photographs, and this is what was um, transferred up here. Yes. Um, yeah. So. And my own relationship to it is I have, you know, uh, basically stacks of these my family has about <clears throat> in uh, film around this area, uh, Santa Clara Valley. Uh, we've been around since, well, the 30s, maybe. If I include my dad working in the fields, yeah, mm -hmm. the 30s. Uh, so there's one uh, video I have that has, or film transfer of this area. It's gotten many hits, but it, because you can see basically how much this area has changed. Yeah. Since. Yeah. <laughs> the uh the the kind of origin of even having a uh digital film collection here in in the universe in the in special collections and archives kind of came from Alfred coming to me with this film of his father. So while the most well all of the other films that we saw came through um, Keith Sanders' work to digitize these kind of historic campus films, um, but the the first uh, digitized film we actually had came from from Alfred mm -hmm. coming to us about digitizing this film that his father had made. Was that the first time you saw it then today? Uh, the transfer, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> any any reactions or, or thoughts on it? Oh, mostly it looks really good. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Um, Armando, uh, can you give us some of the context um, of of yeah, of the Chicano commencement. And uh, you'd also talk to me about the continuity of kind of how things from the Day of Concern film, which some of us saw earlier, uh, into Chicano commencement and the development of ethnic studies. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, let me first of all start with a comment that uh, Chicano commencement didn't come out of nowhere. Actually, the Day of Concern is one of the connections to Chicano commencement. Uh, we had been approaching, we meaning the Chicano Organization on campus, in 66, began approaching the university about uh, trying to increase the enrollment. We were just a handful of people there that, were, that, were, that found our way to universities. And um, we definitely knew that there were a lot of other folks that were as capable as we were that were excluded, and we wanted to open more access to the university. That was, that was the, the driving force behind our organization and Chicano commencement as well. Um, the, uh, the idea of doing commencement grew up after, uh, occurred to us after about two years of trying all kinds of different things, different ways to get the attention of the university. They were not responsive. So we felt that we need to do something very drastic and very dramatic that would have a big impact on the university. And of course, commencement was a place. We also thought that uh, commencement was symbolic. First of all, the university was the oldest university, public university in California at the time, and still is. Um, also, uh, it was very clear to us that San Jose State University uh, was producing people by, by graduating people every year. They were sending out hordes of people into the community that were kind of controlling our situation. There were teachers, lawyers, 
uh, policemen and such, the journalists and so forth. And we felt that they didn't have the faintest idea of what was our community was really about. So we, we proposed to the university that they cancel or postpone rather graduation and immerse the graduating students into a one week seminar to give them some awareness of the Chicano community and Chicano life and Chicano experience. They of course refused. They kept saying that it was not legal for them to do that as much as they would want to and so forth. So it forced our hand. We said, okay, well then in that case, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna disrupt the graduation because it's, it's doing harm to our communities. And so that's the idea be behind Chicano commencement. We had announced uh, in March that we would be bringing in people from all over the, the, the Southwest. We had contacts with people from San Antonio, from different parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California. And we're inviting all those folks to come and join us to disrupt the graduation. At that point, the police became involved and um, we had a late night meeting with well, a, a public meeting with uh, the administration, including uh, Dr. Clark. And uh, we came to a, an understanding that if we were to walk out peacefully, not disrupt, that he would acknowledge our, our concerns and uh, you know, kind, of, kind of give us his blessing to leave the, the graduation ceremony. And that's what we did. Uh, despite that, there was still suspicion. You could see all the number of cops that were around with the, uh, the buses that were there, expecting that we would disrupt the, uh, the ceremony. But we kept our word. And Dr. Clark and the university kept their word. As a consequence, the following semester, which would be the fall semester, um, they admitted 200 Chicano students that they were never able to find. They said we weren't qualified. We couldn't find qualified students. And they also um, admitted 200 Black students as well at that same time as a consequence of Chicano commencement. Um, I should say that at the uh, organizing stages of Chicano commencement, we had the support of the Black Student Union, SDS, a white radical union. We had the support of student government and a lot of other groups on campus were supporting the effort. They felt it was a valid and important uh, point to make and we did. So the university admitted not only Chicano students, but they also told us they couldn't find Chicano faculty that was qualified to teach. They came up with a dozen faculty that fall. They also, um, Excuse me. They also expanded the uh, EOP program, which is providing counseling and financial support to students, and also started the first graduate studies program in Chicago Studies in the nation. So, an historic event, and uh, yeah, the outcomes were, were you know very fruitful. Um, and I'll stop there. Take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Do we have any questions or comments from the audience? Yeah. From my understanding, what you have said uh, was a Chicana commitment ceremony was like a way to protest or was it like to acknowledge Mexican, African-American and Asian American students after they graduated from the university? Were you able to hear the question? Because I'm close to I, I, I only got parts of it. Let me tell me if I get it right. Uh, was was the Chicano commencement was it planned as more of a protest or more of a way to acknowledge uh, Chicano students, Black students, Asian students, uh, and and their accomplishments? Yeah, it was a protest. It was an escalation of our concerns that we had over time. Uh, I remember being at a meeting with. Uh, uh, some of the senior faculty members, Daniel Hernandez and I were there, and they start scolding us. I mean, right off the bat. So I said, "Let's get up. These guys aren't listening." And that 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 typifies the kind of response we got from the university. They weren't listening to our concerns. They didn't understand them or want to understand them. So it led us to escalate the uh, you know our tactics, and ultimately, Chicano commencement was that. We were going to disrupt it. We, ag we agreed not to disrupt it if they would uh, meet some of our demands, and indeed they did. So as a tribute to uh, to Dr. Clark, um, we think that the building on campus now uh, is is to us at Chicano is a, is a symbol and an affirmation of our agreement and the commitments that he made and that we made. Uh, 
to the university. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so my question is, is that when the formal Chicago graduation started separate from the university commencement? Oh, okay, I, so I, I tell me, so Peggy's asking um, from that point forward, was there a Chicano commencement every year as a as a separate event from the university commencement? There was indeed, and um, the commencement became more of a celebration for all these Chicanos that were now graduating in larger numbers. The political genesis for it uh, was excluded from the events to a point where uh, a few years ago, when I was I was called back to teach at the university for, for a semester. Um, I found out that there was a um, an active Chicano grad Chicano commencement program on campus, and the students were raising money to have a big old banquet. I mean, the burden was entirely on the, on the students, and it was exclusionary. If you couldn't come up with the money, you couldn't attend the event. Mm -hmm. So the meaning, the initial meaning of Chicano commencement was lost. It became more of a graduation, which is fine. Graduation ceremony, celebration, which is terrific. People brought their families and so forth. It became a really terrific event. Unlike San Jose State, places like Fresno State uh, covered the cost of a Chicano commencement celebra graduation celebration. And there were hundreds, if not thousands of people, families, extended families, children attending the event and really celebrating the advancement of, of their family, um, love, love members of the family graduating from university. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's become a, a you know, institutionalized program now of celebrating one's graduation among the Chicano community. Chris, you had your hand up? Yeah, um, in those days, was San Jose State doing anything to recruit uh, Chicano, Chicano students, um, or people just show up here willy-nilly by choosing San Jose State over some other university? Uh, it, it's a ladder that happened. There was no recruitment effort. There was no acknowledgement that uh, we were not represented in the university. Uh, and the, the rationale was that, well, you, know, you guys are here. There was a handful of us there on campus, and uh, you guys had the qualifications. You got in. But we knew that there was a lot more folks out there that could and should be attending. So there was no effort made by the university at that time to bring students in. I want to thank Armando and Alfred for being here and Alfred, especially for sharing the film with us. We can give some of them. And that brings us to the end of today's program. Uh, thank you all for being here. If you stayed for three or more film segments, please take a scarf and or a tote bag. Um, also, if you would like a scarf, go back. Thank you for being a panelist. Um, today in one minute, the uh, uh, SJSU Campus Films Collection will go live at digitalcollections.sjsu.edu. The film you just saw will be one of the films um, that is available there. Uh, we don't have all the films there yet, but we are going to be slowly adding them over time. Um, please help yourself to some snacks for the road. And I think, I think that's all for today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.